Okay. Please come back to my I show later, another me. day. Or if not, invite me to your place to sort out your garden as a punishment for not inspiring you. But I'm going to start by inspiring by saying, let's see, the education seminar is absolutely so important. The topic today is absolutely so important. And the first thing is, in terms of giving us your time, I'm going to ask you, wherever you are this morning, turn to the person on your left, on your right, and say, I love you. And the first thing is, I hope, if you've done that, I hope you've said I love you to someone you should be waking up with this morning. If you said I love you to someone who shouldn't be in your household, who shouldn't be waking up with, not just you on your own, you might need to explain that to your wife or your husband, but more importantly, you may also have to explain that to Boris Johnson in terms of the social and physical distancing. On a more serious note, in preparing for this this morning, as you'll expect, um, I had to wake up six o'clock in the morning to put up my makeup, and the other thing I did, was also put on my aftershave. But my son then said to me, he said, Dad, what's the matter with you? People on the virtual conference are not going to smell your aftershave. What that tells me is education. And I said to him, I don't blame him. I don't blame you because I paid for you to go to school. But it's absolutely right. Education should provide our young people with the courage, the empowerment, the curiosity to ask questions. It's absolutely quite important that we allow that to happen. And therefore the seminar today, I will, I will submit upfront, even before colleagues can hear from the speakers, that it's an absolute crime for any child not to receive education. And more importantly, it's an absolute crime if we fail to improve the life chances of our young people, wherever they are throughout the whole world, without the education and the passion that sits behind it. And on that note, I don't know where you wake up this morning, but I need to make sure you drop that cobweb. You might be sitting in your bedroom because I can't see you. You might be sitting in your dining place. You might be wearing your pyjama. It doesn't really matter to me as long as you engage. So, so therefore, to drop all the cobweb early morning, I'm going to ask Mr. Rashid, music, please. Hello? Yeah, we're on it. Whatever you see, all you do, not say yes when you need to say no. Come on, yeah. Thank you very much. If anyone is on this conference call who never sang that song, you either went to one of those posh schools that you have omelette in the morning. Online the school I went to and I gave, gave where we have bread and uh, uh, and um, uh, ewa going. So I hope that's a taste of what you're going to see for the course of today. What I'm going to do now in building up the, the, the show, in leading up to our first speaker, I think it's absolutely important to acknowledge the NSF leadership. Everyone who is a member of NSF is a leader and every one of us is also a fellow or a fellower. It's absolutely important. A leader needs fellowship, fellowship needs a leader. But permit me please to just introduce very briefly 
three colleagues of ours is absolutely important, starting with Bimbo Babaniji. Anyone knows Bimbo Babaniji, his voice and his handsome face belie his age. Mm. He still looks like the 11 year old that visited Buckingham Palace many years ago. Check out the picture on, on whatever. He's an architect by design and by profession. He has successfully built a lot of new builds from small to palatial accommodation and shopping center, which is absolutely brilliant. But the greatest art architect lies in him as a visionary. He is one of the key leaders behind NSF vision and transforming that. He is the chief operating officer. Alongside him is Mr. Wally Sonwu. We call him Mr. NSF. If Mrs. Sonwu is on call this morning, she probably knows she's married to two men, Mr. Sonwu and Mr. NSF. Both of them are two sides of the same coin. So thank you very much for sparing us, Wally. He is, between both of them, Wally is an accountant by profession and he's been to the top of his pinnacle uh, in terms of working for massive housing associations. Between Wally and Mr. Bimbo, they've carried NSM from a vision of one band organization, the Gobi College, having to dream, dare to dream, to transfer this one organization into what is now more than 50 organizations. I will personally, personally deliver both of them to Buckingham Palace, to the queen, who is my mom, Yashali. My name is Charles, so Yashali, to make sure they deserve OBE. They've given birth, not just to this project, but the project now has three legs. It's like a three-legged chair. The first one is the school's um, annual event, then the community work, including uh, distribution of books back in Nigeria to make a community impact. The final part, which is why we're here today, is the education. And like I said, I think both of them need to salute themselves. Igbobi College should be proud of Wale, and Ayetu uh, Compro uh, should be proud of, um, um, of Bimbo. Which leads me to why we're here, and the third leader is Dr. Remy. But before I build up Dr. Remy, I think it's important to acknowledge, like her predecessor, Dr. Nike Arobusoye, who chaired the education for a number of years, with a bit of pay, with a bit of love, with a bit of tears, but with success and determination to succeed, gave the baton to Dr. Remy about a year ago. Dr. Remy, you go down in history of NSF as the first person to organize a virtual NSL. That's gonna be in the Guinness Book of Record. It's absolutely important. And I thank you um, for your patience. I haven't worked with you for the few months to make today happen. I'm sure your PhD in the energy management hasn't prepared you for any of these. What strikes me about you is your positive, welcoming, powerful style, engaging and being thoughtful, but it's still of an appropriate challenge. Unlike Margaret Thatcher, Remy is a lady for turning because she chairs the education committee, not her way, not my way, but her way, the collegiate way, the hallmark of distributive leadership. Dr. Remy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Charles, for the introduction and for introducing our director, Mr. Wale Sonwo, and um, the chief operating officer, Mr. Bimbo Babaridi. Um, thank you. So I thank you all for coming to this platform, joining us this morning. As you heard, my name is Dr. Remy Kayode, and I am the education lead for NSF UK. We are excited to have you all here and I'm sure that we will have a very interesting, educative and informative seminar. Today we will be dealing with the topic, Every Child's Education Matters, with the theme, developing a holistic approach to improving young people's education, the pull and push factors. However, before we hear from the keynote speaker and go into the day in full swing, I would like to acquaint us with one or two things about what this is all about. Nigerian Schools Foundation, NSF UK, started in 2012. And as you may know, it was set up with the general mission of promoting opportunities, connecting Nigerians and developing communities. The forum is for UK-based alumni associations of Nigerian schools. And we now have over 50 schools under the umbrella of NSF UK. Our vision is to provide quality education for all Nigerians with the mission to promote the need 
in maintaining high educational and social standards of Nigerian secondary schools. This for us means being able to impact our students in our old secondary schools in various ways as a means of giving back to the community and our alma mater. It was the late former Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, who will be remembered as an advocate of the most vulnerable populations who once said, knowledge is power, information is liberating, but education is the premise of progress in every society and in every family. For us as NSF UK, we plan and carry out educational activities to develop and maintain a consistent level and increase the level of achievement of students in our schools. Various alumni have responded to such calls by raising funds to embark on and deliver diverse projects to their schools, ranging from providing libraries, providing borehole water, sports equipment, to organizing extracurricular classes for students and paying the teachers that are involved. We've also done projects that include providing computers and IT labs and labs for some of our schools. We recognize that we all have evolved into who we are in our various fields of endeavor, partly because of the education and the life we had in our secondary schools. Although some people have made me realize that for them, the experience had left a negative indelible mark in their lives. The reality is that for a lot of us, we owe who we are partly to the teachings and the life that we experienced in our secondary schools. And for this, we do appreciate our teachers and educators that played such significant roles in our lives. To that effect, NSF Excellence in Education Development, which is the NEED initiative, was launched last year during our seminar. And thankfully, in July, August of this year, we were able to carry out a four-day training program for some of our principals and teachers. This training helped to prepare them for the new norm of teaching and learning and developing their school's improvement plan. The feedback from the teachers and the principals have been positive and with much certainty, I can say that over the coming months, we will see the increase in the level of achievement of our students. We have had several education seminars and it is imperative to know that all efforts of NSF UK and the individual schools under NSF with the various programs organized during education seminar ensure that we provide creative thinking and encourage excellent leadership on improving the life chances of our young people. I am sure that some of the efforts will be seen from some of the entries to our education challenge competition that will be shown later today. As parents, educators, advisors, I want to say to us that we are here for uh, an informative session and that we would recognize and create opportunities to mitigate challenges that inhibit learning at all levels. It is about seeing, thinking, and doing things differently to improve the life chances of all students and all young people. Learning, they say, is a core purpose of schools. However, in these days, and looking into the new norm, it has become a case of unlearning and relearning to enable every student reach their potential. Every young person must be able to seize learning opportunities throughout life to broaden his or her knowledge, skills, and attitudes and adapt to an increasingly changing, complex, and interdependent world. As alumni, we need to foster together and work with our schools in building the capacity of the schools and generate new knowledge that will help to enhance the learning of all students. Although according to Malcolm X, education is the passport to the future for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it. John Dewey, an American philosopher and educationist asserts that education is not just preparation for life, rather education is life itself. Education makes it possible 
for people to stand out as equals and with all the other persons from different walks of life, irrespective of their background, their race, their creed, or their gender. Therefore, education is one of the most powerful things in life as it allows us to find the meaning behind everything and helps to improve life in immense ways. Today's seminar is all about identifying some, some of the push and pull factors that impact learning and education of the young people because every child's education matters. As a team, we are very optimistic that today's event will produce some nuggets and some suggested ways by which alumni represented, parents here, educators, policy makers on this platform will be able to work on improving the life chances of young people and invariably improving the achievements of our young people. So on that note, I want to thank you again for listening and welcome. And I hope that you find this event very useful and informative. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Remy. Um, I wish I was as bright as you with a PhD. You said nuggets. I only associate nuggets with Happy Meal, with McDonald's. But on a more serious note, you're absolutely right. Someone said, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. And somewhere along the line, I'll be sharing some thoughts with you. Which now leads me to our very first um, keynote speaker. Um, a friend of ours and our neighbor from Ghana, to, I call them our friendly neighbor, unlike the metaphor that Alex Ferguson used in describing Manchester City as our noisy neighbor. Our friends from Ghana are not noisy, they're friendly. The banter between Nigerians and our brothers and sisters from Ghana is legendary. We're very happy to have you here today. It's about time we get something back from Ghana. As part of that banter, years of being trashed by Ghana football team, thanks to the legendary Owusu and the legendary Abidi Pele. We now have the gift of Dr. Yao Aduntum from, from Ghana. And I'll share a secret with you before you come on board, sir. I listened to your speech on, um, on Facebook, the speech you delivered to the president of Kenya and his leadership team. If your presentation today is half as good as that, colleagues on this conference call are in for an absolute treat. Here is the son of a farmer and someone from um, uh, Unkrumah Secondary School went to America to make a huge difference in California, not only in terms of your PhD and your master's in California, but the fact that you set up this new design group and a new design school. So much so, our white colleagues in California were celebrating you. You then went back to Ghana. You didn't go back to Ghana. You were headhunted to come back to Ghana. And not surprisingly, you end up as a member of parliament. Not surprisingly, you became the deputy minister in charge of education, absolutely so. And you've continued to improve education in your constituency by injecting resources into computer technology and so on and so forth. Sir, we welcome you to the platform. Thank and the you. The show is now yours for the next 20 minutes or so. Thank you so much. Thank you for a wonderful opportunity and um, giving me the chance to address your August uh, group. I believe that what you are doing is. Um, Commendable, seriously commendable. I wish other uh, alumni from high schools across Africa would do the same in the diaspora uh, to bring resources to their schools and to help their schools uh, become great institutions, even greater than uh, what it was when they were there. Um, I just want to say uh, that Africa uh, is in a good situation. And uh, invariably, when I go to conferences, around the world and they know that I live in California and those schools there, uh, they want to hear from me the horror stories of Africa and the challenges in Africa. And I tell them that I came to Africa to meet uh, the youth who are ready to study. I don't have to do much to get African child to focus on his work in the classroom compared to what I had to do in America to just get the attention of the students. I spent about, used to spend as a teacher, teaching for about 10 years, spent about 50% of my time on classroom management. Just getting the students to sit in the right seats, to pay attention and begin to take their notes. 
Then I walk into a Ghanaian classroom. Whenever you go, you see, they may not even know who you are, but the whole class will stand up for you. And until you tell them to sit, they may keep standing. And um, they are ready to learn. Uh, they are ready to acquire knowledge. But what kind of education are we providing to these students who are eager to learn? Invariably, we have an education system that looks at the students as a bucket to be filled with knowledge from the teacher. The teacher is seen as a sage on stage, the wisest person in the room. He speaks, everybody keeps quiet. He speaks, everybody writes it. At the end of about three months, at the end of the trimester, the teacher then asks them, what did I say? And the student will give it back to the teacher. In Ghana, they call that chill, poor, pass, and forget. In other jurisdictions, we call it rote memorization. Unfortunately, these students are not going to operate in a world where they can just enter a company and be hired based on their ability to memorize. Unfortunately for us at this point, the world has moved into the fourth industrial revolution. The era of the steam engine, the first industrial revolution is long gone. The second, which happens to be four by electricity is long gone. Electronics and computers was the next one with automation is going. Now we are moving into the fourth industrial revolution. A place where you can only succeed if you can think critically. A place where you will thrive if your students as a nation have mastered the four C's. The first being creativity, the second being critical thinking, uh, the third being effective communication, and the fourth being collaboration. How do we ensure that students in Africa have been equipped with the four C's? so that our countries can really compete in the fourth industrial revolution. Now, if we do not move our students into this space, into a space where they will become critical thinkers, into a space where they will not defer all knowledge to the teacher, in a space where they will respectfully challenge the thinking in the classroom and be allowed to participate, then Africa's future, even though we have the world's most beautiful population, will not be able to harness the demographic dividend and transform the fortunes of our continent. So as we look at the fourth industrial revolution, the question that we have to ask ourselves is how do we change the education system? How do we ensure that Africa is ready for the 21st century in a very unique way? How can Africa participate in the fourth industrial revolution? In this revolution where the cyberspace and physical is connected, and the internet of things, you connect your house to the internet, you are at work and you can link up at going to your house and see if your refrigerator has everything that you need. And in case you are short on something, you can order. Now you come to Ghana and now people are doing their passports online. And I always say to myself, what are we doing to bridge the digital divide? So those people who are left behind technologically will not be left behind forever. Our education system needs a serious revamping. So as you work with your schools, I think one of the things you can really do to help is when you do not only take interest in building infrastructure for the school, but you also begin to dialogue with the heads of your schools about how students are being taught in your schools about how teachers are being trained in the school so that they will allow space for the children to participate in the teaching and learning process. How do you get the children to become critical thinkers when lesson plans are being done on the old Bloom taxonomy? And the best you can get under the old Bloom taxonomy when you start with remembering, understanding, and, and hopefully going all the way to evaluation and leaving it there instead of moving on to creation. Research have now shown, and that's where new Bloom taxonomy was created. And for those of you who are not teachers, it is architecture for learning. When we talk about the new Bloom taxonomy, it's the blueprint for ensuring that students understand exactly what they are supposed to know and you guide them through the process so that they can truly become, in the terms of the cognitive domain, the terms of thinking, what you want them to be.
And instead of talking about pollution and the causes of pollution in the classroom in case we are treating the environment, it is good for them to know why pollution is bad to their health. What is the cause? What are the causes of pollution? All those things. But if you really want the students to become the critical thinkers of the future, which we want them to be, then not only are you going to let them know what are the causes of pollution and the effects of pollution, but you are also going to look at how do you create a city without pollution, maybe the project that the students have to work on. And when that project is being done, it will bring about collaboration. The students are going to have to brainstorm and come together. And once they exchange ideas, they are going to be able to design a city without pollution, where they will say, maybe the source of our power energy should be solar energy. And once they do that, they also have to communicate the ideas so they become effective communicators in the process and creativity will be brought to the fore. By the end of the day, you have students who are creative, critical thinkers, effective communicators and collaborators. And those are the essential skills we need in the 21st century. Then you begin to then take a look at how do we ensure that these students are part of the ecosystem for the total transformation of the country. This brings us to a point where you are looking at the fact that if one student does not go to school, it's not just a loss for that student, but essentially it's a loss to the nation because that student could have brought to fall some invention, something that could have transformed their country. I always ask Ghanaians, imagine the person who invented, uh, who, who brought Uber. Is from Ghana. In, in, imagine the person who brought about a WhatsApp is from Ghana. Do you know the tax revenues that will be collecting from around the world to bring into the Ghanaian economy? If Ghanaians, Nigerians are able to bring about some of these creative inventions and ideas in our own countries, the money that will be coming to our country will be so tremendous and probably one person, two people, imagine if Bill Gates are from Ghana. He can take the whole country out of poverty. Creativity is what's going to transform Africa. But that creativity is not just going to come, it's going to come when we demand it. As important stakeholders in the education space, we got to demand it. In our own small ways, whenever we find ourselves and we are helping our schools, we should not just focus on the physical infrastructure, but we have to look at the human infrastructure. We have to begin to look at how do we transform our schools. In Ghana, we have been, we've had a great opportunity of introducing free senior high school. Um, over the last 60 plus years of independence, a number of students were not getting opportunity for secondary education because their parents had to pay and some of them could not afford, even though the government was subsidizing it. Three years ago, the government introduced the free senior high school, ensuring that the universal asset to secondary and technical education for all, irrespective of your station in life. The transformation agenda of the government has begun by opening the floodgates of secondary education. And with that, we are now looking at how do we move up our gross tertiary enrollment ratio. The most important predictor of socioeconomic transformation is how well you use your tertiary sector for socioeconomic transformation. How do you equip your people with the requisite skills so that they can change your country? See, in the 1980s, the World Bank and other Britain Woods institutions told Africans, and for that matter, developing countries that don't invest in higher education. Higher education is a private good. Invest in primary, and sick, and primary education and junior high school and forget about uh, universities is for private goods for the individual. So allow people to either sink or swim. If they can afford to let them do it. Little did we know that in the 1990s, they were going to tell us that was actually not the case. And that higher education brings tremendous dividends to countries. If you look at the invention of the Embraer aircraft in Brazil, invented by a university in Brazil in partnership with MIT, it tells you something about the role of higher education and national transformation. Now, if you look at the gross tertiary enrollment ratio of Africa as a continent, when you look at the fact that if you look at the, um, the people on the continent between the ages of 18 to 23, 
if you look at every hundred of them, our average is about 7% with some kind of tertiary education or, or in some kind of tertiary education institution. Research have shown that if you don't move your country's gross tertiary enrollment to about 40% plus, you are not talking about sustainable growth and development. This is the task ahead of us as Africans. And the task ahead of us, even though challenging, is exciting. Because we are at the bottom and we cannot go lower than that. We can only move up, but we are only going to move up when we begin to focus on the further education as research has shown. shown. Various researches have been done. Hanushek and other people have done research to show that education is the most important factor for socioeconomic transformation and that the greatest mind, the greatest numera that has not been mined is the white brain, the brains that we have. And that if we were to invest in education and bring the vast majority of our people into a space where they can truly be trained and be educated, where they can truly have the opportunity for quality education, then the transformation will happen. So we have to begin to look at what kind of education do we do? What kind of education system do we create? Now, for education to be fit for purpose, we need to look at access, we need to look at quality, we need to look at the relevance of our education system. And within that concept, context, we can talk about holistic education. Now, in terms of access, we need to make sure that in our various nations, the vast majority of our people have access to education from kindergarten all the way to the universities. And that is where the gross social enrollment ratio comes to the fore. In Ghana, we did a fantastic job over the years with free compulsory universal basic education, but I forgot about secondary. Now we have opened the floodgates of secondary education to all. Now we are looking at creating a robust student loan system uh, based on our party's manifesto going to elections in December 7th to make sure that everybody can have access to funding for tertiary education by borrowing at a very low interest rate and going to school and paying it back after they secure a job. Once we can do that, then we begin to see that the education transformation that will be fit for purpose is now being developed. But access in itself is not a guarantor for using education for socioeconomic transformation. We have to begin to look at the quality of the education system. And that is why we have to begin to look at holistic education. Not only are we interested in the arithmetic and, and reading and writing the three hours, we have now to begin to look at the affective domain issues. Issues that will really equip our people to aspire for greatness and begin to know that their future is ahead of them and that the brightest days of the country is ahead of us and is in their hands. And when you begin to look at issues bordering on the affective domain, you begin to look at what are the skill sets that our students need to acquire. When they receive information, are they able to internalize it in such a way that they organize the ideas and make it something that is part and parcel of their lives? And before you can do that, education system have to begin to take a look at what is called the hidden curriculum. Hidden curriculum are those values that are transmitted to students in the school without a lesson plan. Without necessarily telling them they should be patriotic in selected textbooks and stories and activities in the school that makes them think about their country first. You walk into any American school, an American classroom, you see the American flag in the classroom. And you see them reciting their national pledge at football games singing the national anthem, American children growing up and thinking that their country is the best in the world and that they as individuals can transform the fortunes of their country. It's never part of the explicit curriculum, but it's part of the hidden curriculum. America had to do that because they knew that they could not openly indoctrinate their students like it was done in Russia. And therefore they took a look at what kind of curriculum can transform the fortunes of their nation. You cannot graduate from an American school and get a high school diploma without taking a class in government and economics and without participating in various ceremonies in school that speaks to the fact that you are from the greatest nation on earth. 
if the books that we are reading is not add value to what our students should think and become, we are selling our nation short. And we don't have to do much. The children don't even have to know. You select the stories that will begin to empower them to understand that the fortunes of their nation can be transformed. In fact, the future of Nigeria, the future of Ghana is in their hands. And once that empowerment is working, then you can begin to see the transformation because at that point, if the cognitive domain is right, if students are being helped to think at the highest level possible and that creativity is coming to the fore, then you have the other aspects, that hidden curriculum that is molding them to understand that Africa can be transformed. If we as a people don't believe that nations will be transformed, nobody can do it for us. So as an old student and as a group, you are doing a fantastic, but I also believe that if you begin to focus on other aspects of the Nigerian child in your competitions, issues that borders on how you transform the country. If there was an essay competition for students to write about what they want Nigeria, to, where they want Nigeria to be and what they want Nigeria to be and how they want the country transformed, you'd be amazed that one of those students who write about transformation of Nigeria the essay that they write will be one day what they will become president and they will implement it. That may be seeds of progress that you have shown that is going to transform your country. You know, education is not simply about failing children with knowledge, but it comes from the Latin word educare, which means bringing out what is in the person. How do we ensure that we bring out the best in our students? We have a role to play. And the future of Africa, as I said in Kenya, depends on us. Sometimes we may minimize it. We may think it's beyond us. We may think it's a basket case. We may think Africa has nothing much to offer and that the problems are so much that there's nothing we can do. I came into Ghana fully aware that there were going to be challenges. I remember coming back to Ghana and telling my friends that I was leaving a job that was paying a lot of money I was leaving a job that had given me influence with about 200 workers and we're doing some big things in Southern California, specifically in Los Angeles, and telling my friends I was coming back to Ghana and the usual refrain was, you are going to be very frustrated. Ghanaians will not pay attention to anything we say. They will just tell you that you brought all these ideas from America, so what? But I always told them that if I go back to Ghana and people don't understand what I'm talking about is my fault and not their fault. And they'll say, why can that be your fault? And I told them, that means I have not been able to communicate effectively with them. That's why they don't understand what I'm talking about. And I've been proving right. I'm not to talk about myself, but I'll tell you. Meet people, people call me after interviews. I meet people on the street that tells me you are changing the face of politics in terms of how you level with us, in terms of how you communicate with us. We don't see in you the issue of politician that we can see. Because we see humility. We see that if you don't understand something, you don't do propaganda about it. And I tell them, I don't have time for propaganda. The future of Africa is so, uh, so much on our shoulders. And I'm lucky to have a president who thinks that way. And now the president of Ghana, who is ending almost the first time, um, by the grace of God, going to a second time, wants to transform this country. And that sense of agency has brought us into a space where, God willing, the transformation of Ghana is closer than we ever thought. And I believe that the transformation of Africa will come. But it's going to come when we all put our shoulders to the wheel. When we begin to even, first of all, believe that it's possible. If we don't believe it's possible, we are not going to bring up the ideas that will help us do just that. If we believe that it cannot happen, it's not going to happen. And for the young people who may be listening, begin to understand that your future, wherever you find yourself, is linked up with the future of Nigeria. And that when Nigeria does well, you even do well wherever you find yourself. Asian Americans in the US had challenges with racism and other things that was going on in America many years ago, when Asia rose and became a great continent, they are now very well respected in the American space. 
Africans respect around the world, wherever you find yourself in the diaspora, will of course increase tremendously when we're able to transform Africa. And we are not going to be able to transform Africa when we don't look at how we can help change our education system. And that is why I'm, based on my experience in Ghana, looking at how do we change the curriculum. Yeah, the Western curriculum is great, but we need to have an assertive curriculum, develop an African child who don't sit there and just wait for the teacher to fill him with knowledge, but the African child who will challenge the thinking in the classroom. An African child who will say to the teacher, sir, respectfully, I think this can be done differently. And we can think about this differently. It is the African child who one day work in an industry or invent something because he was trained to think critically. 21st century will not be waiting for us. The fourth industrial revolution will not be waiting for us. We have to, as Africans, move forward in a way where we begin to see that <coughs> our future is with us. If you look at the hero's journey by Joseph Campbell and begin to look at stages that people go through and others will succeed, you can see that we cannot live in the ordinary world. We cannot simply refuse the call and then succeed. We have to get out of the ordinary world after we get the call. By the grace of God, we may meet a mentor who will guide us, but we will go through an ordeal. And at the end of the ordeal, success will come. Our lives will be transformed. Africa will be transformed. And NSF will leave a legacy for Nigeria and for Ghana. Thank you for inviting me. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Yao. I wasn't disappointed because like I said at the beginning of the introduction, I was fortunate to have watched your presentation to President um, Kanyeta and his leadership team. And you've actually excelled at, you've delivered thought-provoking issues with passion, with energy, and um, um, questions are beginning to flow. Colleagues on the conference call, please, throughout the course of today, begin to post your question. Questions are flowing already for Dr. Yao, but we've got a question and answer panel later in the day. So uh, hold the fire, but post your questions on that side. Thank you so much. Uh, if that is the taste of the thing to come, I'm beginning to ask myself, why didn't we organize this seminar to be a whole week, never mind a half a day? Because it's absolutely interesting. The issue you talked about, the four C's, people are asking questions already. Um, the cognitive information rather than, rather than curiosity impacted in our key. So thank you so much. If I just move seamlessly to, to the next program, and, it, and I said seamlessly because it flows from what Dr. Yao said, in terms of challenging us as old students, what can you do for your school? What can you give back? The school that raised up us to where we are, something has to be given back. So there is a competition which uh, uh, we've been charged ourselves at asking, how well have you made a difference to your school? It's very easy to walk away. Hans Akimbu, Martha Gabe, do nothing. I said, my former school has gone on to do with me. I think it will be remiss of us as leaders not to do that. Um, because someone said a small group of thoughtful and dedicated old students can change the world of their former school and absolutely believe in that. I'm sure, which is why some of us here belong to old student associations. Another note, I'm gonna call on my brother. I believe he's gonna introduce the competition and explain how he came about the vision of the competition. I call him my brother. He called himself a chief. He called himself Chief Akagu Niyikuku, but he's my brother. He went to St. Fimbas College. I went to Amadia College. He wouldn't dare look at me in the eyes in those days because Amadia College would trash St. Fimbas on the field and off the field. Niyikuku, Chief, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, my brother. I definitely cannot look you in the eyes. I look up to you, though. Yeah, as um, my brother said, um, Charles had said, my name is Akogu Niyikuku, and I was cultured at St. Fimbas College, as he mentioned. 
and that's the best school in Africa, I must say. And that's the best school. It's going to challenge me, but that's the, that's the way it is. Anyway, yeah, I'm opportune to represent my alumni at yeah. NSF, NSF um, and I'm a member of the education team as well as the communications team as well. Now, the education challenge is an idea that, coined, that was coined out by the team to assess the impact of the annual seminars that we organize and thereby identifying rooms for innovation. Now, when we started this, we have six alumni that submitted entries for the competition. And a video clip that summarizes each person's um, submission will be shown. And that's, the, the schools are St. Fimbas College, Akoka, Lagos, Government College, Igorodu, Lagos, Holy Child College, Obalinde, Lagos, Reagan Memorial Baptist School, Sabo, Lagos, Amadia College, Agege, Lagos, and then Baptist Academy, Ilupeju, Lagos. So I'll please have the technical team, you know, play the uh, extract from the clips that were submitted. Well, while that is happening, um, okay. Good afternoon. My name is Tokumbo Derende. I'm now going to hand over to Dikin Abodunre, who would share his experience of his journey on the training and some of the things he's taking back to the school. Abodunre Emmanuel, Principal of Baptist Academy of Anikoro, Lagos, Nigeria. We are here to appreciate NSF UK in collaboration with Bausa UK, who provided a platform that enhanced the capacity, the skill and competence of our teachers recently. We are here saying a big thanks to you for that wonderful opportunity. We want to assure you that the program called NEED, teacher training program that we participated in recently was highly impactful. First, the set of students that benefited from the program, that the JS3 students who have just concluded their Becker examination, which is their day. I'm Charles Obazwa, the president of our own student association, Akausa UK. Working with NSF, especially around the education center every year, uh, I was I had a dream of setting up um, a training arrangement. And with the support of Council of Bennington, the former mayor of Bramley Council, I was able to establish a tuning arrangement with one of the best grammar schools set all labs in Kent. And working with them, we established a tuning arrangement with my former school. And it is the first old student tuning arrangement um, ever in the UK. And on the back of that, that has had an impact on the relationship between my former school and central labs. You listen to testimonies from the students. We are the students of our Islam Del College of West Nigeria, the first Muslim college in West Africa, one of the leading standards of learning in Nigeria, which provides enormous opportunities for students to excel in their academic pursuits for knowledge and impact moral and gives out scholarships to the best students in the section. Moreover, my school has improved the students moral in and out. Lady Balago, President of Roga UK, Reagan Memorial Baptist Girls Secondary School, Sabo Yaba, Lagos. Right from 2012, yes, from the start 2012, Roga UK has recognized the uniqueness of NSF. That is why we have been fully involved with the delivery of NSF initiatives. It continues to be a privilege to be part of NSF projects and events that is encouraging Nigerian school at the student in diaspora and help to develop educational aspiration in schools in Nigeria. Entered 10 students uh, into the Commonwealth and I'm happy to say that three students were well, actually we got two silver awards out of 11,000 essays, right? Applicant. Without further the Queen's Essay Competition was put together by what we call the Nigerian School Foundation, United Kingdom. Hey John, how are you doing today? I am fine, thank you. I am proud to be a student of St. Finbar's College. 
do you know that our school library is one of the best in Nigeria? Of course I do. Our teachers are competent and knowledgeable. They let us take charge of our learning. Yes. They also make us do research and projects under their supervision. The school is putting so much effort into making sure learning takes place online during COVID-19 lockdown. Yes, I get to learn even from the comfort of my house. My name is Olu Dada and we are Government College Ikurudu UK Chapter. We have had pr the privilege of being involved with NSS since its inception and we have participated in various NSF-led seminars. This has given us an opportunity to improve our school through various projects. Our first was to provide clean water system via a borehole to improve the lifestyle of our students. We attended the Digital Education Seminar 2008 where our school presented and had lots of questions and suggestions and from that seminar we embarked My name is Vicky Oluoshefessa and I am the president of the Holy Child College UK alumni and I would like to talk to you briefly about the impact of the NSF UK set one of the seminars um, impact on the progress of pupils in my school. In November 2017, the NSF um, delivered a seminar on the needs of the next generation. And after attending this seminar, the um, UK alumni decided that one of the best ways to serve the needs of our pupils, the next generation, will be by laying emphasis on teacher training to be better equipped for the educational needs of the next generation and to ensure that people's progress and achievement can be encouraged by providing access to world educational stage, encouraging participation in educative competitions, scholarships, and providing incentive for participation. Yes, thank you very much, the technical team. Uh, please, before we move on, I would like to request a favor from the audience and everybody to please unmute yourselves and give these teams, the alumni that are presented, a big round of applause for their efforts. Yes. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I would also like to apologize for the echoing that you were experiencing earlier. I was just trying to play it safe by having three devices on at the same time, but I have come out of two of them. So as an Ijebu man, I have to do that. Anyway, now um, with this, um, we have the overall winning alumni to be given a sum of a prize of 150 pounds towards the training need program that's organized by NSF through the education team. Now, if it happens that a, a school that has already uh, started participating in the needs program, this 150 pounds can be taken away from the next program that, um, that's scheduled to, to hold, that's the future ones. And the first and second runners up will be awarded a plaque as well as certificate of participation. And every other person, or every other alumni that's participated will be given certificates of participation. Certificate of participation. Now, um, to achieve this aim, we set up an impartial panel of judges from varied alumni and um, they were the ones that actually handled the selection process so that you know we can show a high sense of impartiality as well as transparency. And the person that's going to be presenting the process and the criteria used, the winner is in person of Ms. Adijoke Hastra. Thank you, my dear. Thank you, um, Akogumi Kuku. Um, yeah, I represent, and I should actually say good afternoon, everyone. Um, I actually represent a panel of five judges, and um, we actually had five areas by which each entry was judged. Um, we looked at the delivery and persuasion strategies that were used. 
we looked at the use of the facts and evidence that was presented in the presentations. Um, again, we needed to look at, because the important thing is how the NSF seminars had impacted on what was going on with alumni back home. So we looked at the reference or key referencing <clears throat> to the seminars or any of the seminars that took place between 2016 and 2019. Timing was crucial because they had a timing of five minutes and the overall impact whereby we were looking at the what purpose, was it very clear? And then topping that up with next steps. We actually had fun doing this um, to make sure that it wasn't just um, subjective. We had a score sheet, which each of us watched the videos and then scored them individually. Off the back of that, we then reconvened and we then put all the marks together and worked out an average. We had fun doing this, and I must say that great things are actually happening back home um, with the links here. All the entries were brilliant, and I would say, please, the next competition that comes up, um, make sure you enter. I'm going to make sure that we actually put an entry in. But um, the three winners that I'm going to go, so I'm going to go from third to first. Coming in at third was um, Baptist Academy, Old School Association. Second, quite closely, was Reagan. And I have a drum roll, if that is possible. The entry that actually anonymously actually scored flat out across the board, hitting every single theme, was actually Holy Child. Thank you. Hold on, Holy Child. Okay. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> I didn't expect anyone. Congratulations. Yes. <laughs> oh, dear. Action, so, not yes. words. Action, yes, thank you very much. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, you won this year. <laughs> I bet you we'll, we'll College will win, next, win year. next year. We will win next year. Uh, we'll win again next year. All right. We we'll like to. We'll Mr. Like Cuckoo, to can we move on for swiftly, please? I'm conscious of time. Yes. Sorry. That's what I was going to say that, you know, we need to now show the video clip. That won the full clip. Can the technical team please um, show that to us? Thank you. My name is Vicky Oluoshi Fessa, and I am the president of the Holy Child College UK alumni. And I would like to talk to you briefly about the impact of the NSF UK, one of the seminars, um, impact on the progress of pupils in my school. In November 2017, the NSF um, delivered a seminar on the needs of the next generation. And after attending this seminar, the um, UK alumni decided that one of the best ways to serve the needs of our pupils, the next generation, will be by laying emphasis on teacher training to be better equipped for the educational needs of the next generation and to ensure that people's progress and achievement can be encouraged by providing access to world educational stage, encouraging participation in educative competitions, scholarships, and providing incentive for participation. And as God would have it, one of the um, NSF members um, decided to deliver a teacher training um, seminar which focused on comparative teaching methods needed to tackle and engage the new generation. Holy Child College was the only NSF membered school who enrolled a teacher on the course. The feedback from the school and the teacher indicated an increase in staff morale and improvement in teaching. And this format was used to um, cascade training on, for new teachers 
who come into the school. And as you can see in the slides, the result of this is um, the Holy Child College won the West African Quality Education Awards because it was able to deliver um, good, innovative quality education. And that definitely has had an impact on the progress of pupils in our schools. And you can also see that um, the certificate of attendance of the teacher that attended the training course. Um, a follow on from this is the NSF Youth Engagement Team usually advertise um, competitions. And one of these is um, the Queen's Commonwealth Essay Writing Competition, which Holy Child College um, entered um, three students. We encouraged participation in this and it was the first time the school had done this and we won a silver award and two bronze awards and in one of the slides you can see um, the presentation being made to the students who um, won these awards and this definitely has provided incentive for all other students who now are actually battling to take part in any competition or scholarship um, innovations that we send to the school. This year, the 2020 Commonwealth Award um, essay, um, 15 students have been entered and we're hoping that we would get 15 students win gold medal. So gold medal, so uh, gold awards rather. So this, this is definitely um, a, a progress for our school pupils. Um, following on from last, late last year, um, Holy Child College encouraged um, uh, the school to enter the girls into um, the African Science School scholarship applications. We, we were the only NSF member school who invited reps from, from the academy to make a presentation to our parents and to our teachers. And as a result of this, five parents made applications for the scholarship for this year. But due to COVID, uh, we haven't heard anything yet, but we are quite optimistic and we believe we'll be able to get this um, award and uh, to get scholarships, sorry. Furthermore, we also um, entered 19 pupils into the Conrad Challenge, a purpose-driven innovation competition, creating the next generation of entrepreneurs who will change the world. And 19 Holy Child Peoples won $60,000 each to study at Claxon University in the UK. So as you can see, no doubt that the UK, the NSF UK seminar, education seminar, did impact on our teacher training and also impacted on the progress of the pupils of our schools. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. You'll agree with me that that was, that was really good. Um, I'm going to hand over to the moderator to continue now because you know, time is running against us. Thank you very much for all the participating alumni. And um, next year, we'll meet again. Uh, uh, th th thank you, my brother. The moderator, I'm going to drop off because how dare you not um, watch the things to my old school? Um, so I'm going to be charging for the moderation rule because um, I thought I was going to win, so I decided to do this free of charge. On a more serious note, on a more serious note, the key thing is, well done to Holy Child, a well-presented argument, well done to every participating school. Like the Olympics vision, participation is more important. I hope we can learn from that and um, all the various schools on this conference call can go back and be inspired to do something from their school. That's the challenge Dr. Yao set us, and I think it's important. And that's the legacy, our footprint that we can leave behind. If I move swiftly, because I'm conscious that uh, again, we're running out of time, hopefully we'll be able to gain some time later to introduce the next session. The next section we have from the keynote speakers. So from now on, you'll be, we'll be listening to some sub themes, all as part of this holistic approach the various things, the pool and the push factors um, in terms of impact on education. The very first one is of safeguarding. I remember a year ago, the speaker um, challenged us to look at safeguarding issue in, in Nigerian schools in particular. And, um, and on top of, uh, on the back of that, 
we then went back to him and said, let's say, you need to give us your perspective on safeguarding. He's more than well qualified to give this perspective. And I'll build him up because he deserves it. One is, he's so good, they name him Ade twice. So he's, a, he's crowned twice. I see that wasn't enough. The queen decided to add OBE to his name. So it's Ade, Ade Tosoye OBE. He's the chief executive of London Borough of Bromley. So treat him very well, because he's my, he's my boss. But more importantly, he carries a national profile, not just in Bromley, not just in London, across the whole nation. I wish you were proud of him because he's one of ours. He's the first black chief executive of London Borough of Bromley. He's only one of four black chief executives in London, only one of six black chief executives in England. So what a massive, massive achievement. I'm proud of him and we should be proud of him. His work extends to, in 2016, he was part of the national team uh, put together by the government to look at safeguarding issues in Ofsted. He's got the, what do you call the free man of the city of London. As a free man of the city of London, he can do and undo anything. So if you know him, if you get a parking ticket in the city of London, just call Ade, he might write it off for you. He's also a free man of Habadasha, which is absolutely important. And recently, in the last few weeks, he was crowned the runners up, highly commended, highly commended runners up in the what they call the local government chief executive of the year. Bearing in mind, you're talking about close to over 200 local uh, government uh, councils across London. For him to have come second, having been a chief executive just for the last two years, is a tremendous, tremendous achievement. Ade Adetosoye OBE, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Charles, um, and thank you um, for the uh, warm uh, introduction today. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. I'm delighted to be joining you today. And thank you to the Nigerian Schools Foundation for hosting um, this important uh, conference. It's a real privilege to be part of these important discussions on the integral role of safeguarding in pursuing a holistic approach to educating children and young people. Really to set the context, the United Nations in 2016 said children suffered violence at the hands of adults unseen and unheard for centuries. But now that the scale and impact of violence is becoming visible, they cannot be kept waiting for longer for the effective protection to which they have an unqualified right. The attitude survey in 2017 found that 64% of girls aged 13 to 21 had experienced some form of sexual violence or sexual harassment at school or colleges in the past year. And the impact of these on educational outcomes is significant. The National Education Union in 2018 found that a third of female students and 6% of male students in boarding schools have personally experienced sexual harassment or abuse at school. They went on to say that poor education outcomes led to um, the poor safeguarding um, that these children encountered. <laughs> the Johnson Soft survey in 2019 also found that the schools with poor safeguarding arrangements often have poor education attainment and argued that a safe environment is paramount to the learning outcomes of students and their attainment. So just again, conference this morning, this data actually tells us that effective safeguarding is a pull factor in children attaining good educational outcomes and that a safe and secure environment is required for children to attain well in education. So conference, promoting the welfare of children is everyone's responsibility and nothing is more important than safeguarding children and promoting their welfare. Everyone who comes into contact with children and families has a role in creating an appropriate atmosphere for effective learning and safe environment for students. So the fundamental question today is why do I believe that safeguarding and child protection processes and systems in schools help to secure greater outcomes for our children? For me, there's no greater responsibility as chief executive in the London Borough of Bromley 
than promoting the health, well-being and safety of our children. As a social worker by background, I know that when a child grows up in a safe and stable home and can access a safe school environment, they do well in education. Our children, whatever the background and no matter what challenges they face, deserve a safe environment in which to learn. A child growing up in a safe home and a safe school environment uh, where physical needs and emotional needs are met is actually more likely colleagues to succeed in education, is more likely to be resilient uh, and more likely to have poor mental health and more likely to engage less in risky behaviours, including criminality and violence. Again, in the London Borough of Bromley, uh, we support over 80,000 children and over 100 schools to ensure the delivery of effective safeguarding in all our schools. The evidence is actually there, uh, whereby 95% of all our schools in Bromley are good or outstanding, and 100% are absolutely good or outstanding when it comes to safeguarding issues. So we know, conference, that schools and colleges are important part of the wider child protection system. They are in a position to identify concerns early in a child's life and provide help for children and prevent concerns from escalating. So I truly believe that together we can go even further in creating a positive, secure and safe environment for children across all the stages of their development. So for me, good educational outcomes, safeguarding and keeping children safe is therefore one of the key requirements and a significant pull factor in supporting our children. Colleagues conference um, this afternoon, in our conversation today, I really would like to spend um, the next 10 minutes or so to talk about two fundamental issues. What do we do in this country to keep children safe in our schools? And then the second key question is, what are the key policy recommendations for our schools in Nigeria to keep children safe? So conference, if you allow me to start in terms of safeguarding in the UK, we recognize the legislative context in this country recognizes that safeguarding is everyone's responsibility and everyone who comes into contact with children in education has a role to play in keeping them safe. Schools and educational settings are therefore a crucial part in the wider safeguarding system. Educational professionals in this country must be able to identify and report concerns for a child's welfare so that these concerns can be escalated and, and addressed appropriately. In order to fulfill these responsibility effectively, all safeguarding practitioners working in schools work in a child-centered manner. This means that they consider at all times what's in the best interest of the child. Again, a uh, conference um, in this country, um, schools are inspected on their safeguarding arrangements by Ofsted as regulators to ensure that their good governance arrangements are in line with the legislative context. As such, there is widespread evidence that good and effective safeguarding arrangements lead to good educational outcomes. The, the second thing, again, really to throw out is all schools in the UK have um, uh, local child protection policies and procedures, and school staff are all trained in safeguarding. In my own local authority in Bromley, uh, as I said, we work closely with our schools to ensure that all professionals working in schools do safeguard our children. We know again in the UK, the governance arrangement in terms of leaders and governing bodies, recognizing the importance of effective safeguarding and child protection on outcomes for our children and outcomes on learning. This again is reviewed by the governing bodies every single time. And again, we recognize in this country, the greater awareness of safeguarding in terms of the educational outcomes are clearly understood by all schools. To illustrate, that, to illustrate these schools understand that poor safeguarding uh, practices lead to poor educational outcomes. We recognize in this country on online safety, uh, clearly my lead uh, to bullying of children online, uh, which again will impact on the educational outcomes. In the context of the current pandemic, where more and more children have been educated online, it's absolutely even important for us to ensure that our children are safe online. Schools, again, in this country work with our local authority partners 
uh, to ensure that the key issues around safeguarding uh, be child sexual exploitation, um, CSC, child criminal exploitation, peer-on-peer -peer abuse, serious violence, and FGM, and mental health issues are well understood. So our schools at the UK conference recognize the negative impact of these issues on the welfare of children and also on their educational attainment. So in summary, again, why does it work in this country? We create a safe environment for children, young people to, uh, to, to learn. We ensure that adults who work in schools, including volunteers, uh, do not pose a risk as well uh, to our children. Uh, we make sure that children are well-trained um, and staff are well-trained in supporting our children. And we maintain a safe environment for our children uh, to be safe. As I said, uh, conference, the second part of my conversation today is really that asking the fundamental question, what can we do in Nigeria to make sure that our children are safe? We recognize again in today's world, in Nigeria, children have become more vulnerable and safeguarding and protecting the Nigerian child from abuse is fundamental to learning. No week passes without an allegation of abuse of a Nigerian child. In the newspapers, it's becoming a worrying trend which requires a necessity for swift and effective response to combat this menace and stem the shocking tide of abuse and terror on our children. So the question conference today, and I really want to spend my last four or five minutes on this, what can we do to ensure that the Nigerian child is actually safe? And I'm going to really go through just five key things for this morning or this afternoon conference, we can call upon the government to really extend the viability of extending the children, um, the Child Rights Act to include wider safeguarding measures in schools, not just on trafficking, whilst I recognize the approach in terms of supporting trafficking are welcome. But the importance of effective safeguarding and child protection on learning must be fully understood and um, at both national and state levels. As such, legislation on safeguarding is required and must be introduced by government. Once this is introduced, all schools through the Ministry of Education should be compelled to have robust child protection and safeguarding practices in place. This should clearly be linked to funding received by those schools uh, to ensure the compliance. Again, conference this afternoon, NSF can champion this by calling the Nigerian government to put this in place. And we can even go further, NSF, by actually drafting the legislation uh, for parliament. With a number of lawyers at today's conference, this is achievable conference this morning. I know this won't happen overnight, let's be frank, which is why we need to also think about the key measures we can put in place now, today, to ensure that our children are safe and have the fundamental right to good learning environment and be protected uh, from um, any child protection concerns. A search again conference, the four key things that we can actually do whilst we're waiting for central government to really have the legislation in place. Schools, in the absence of legislation coming from central government, uh, in the short term, our schools in Nigeria can be encouraged to introduce effective child protection policies, not just to see paying schools. Through the work of the NSF, sample safeguarding policies and procedures, policies on behavior management and safer recruitment can also be routine and sent to all schools linked to the NSF. Again, conference with a number of child protection experts, including myself at today's conference, this is within our game. The, the third, I guess, is the effective training for all schools and all teachers uh, in Nigeria. All staff should receive appropriate safeguarding and, safe, uh, and, and, and child protection training, uh, which is regularly updated. In addition, all staff should receive safeguarding and child protection training. I'll say this again through the work of NSF, that we can actually put this in place by really writing some of the safeguarding training programs distributed to all schools linked to the NSF. The last two key things, again, conference really to say, is we recognize that change will take some time to be fully embedded as such through the work of NSF. We can encourage all schools in Nigeria or the schools linked to NSF 
to also our designated safeguarding leads in play. This approach will enable us to implement change at a quicker pace and also at the ground level. Designated safeguarding leads will fully uh, will be fully trained on the correlation between effective educational outcomes and good child protection systems. I challenge my fellow colleagues at conference today that in the same way that we raise funds for boots and desks, we can also raise funds for training and for embedding safeguarding in our schools. And lastly, to ensure we create a competitive environment in Nigeria for both fee-paying schools and public schools, the introduction of the national minimum standards on, on safety can be deployed. In the same way, again, through the work of NSF and through the colleagues on the call today at conference, we can easily put together the key standards around safeguarding that can be distributed to our schools. So in summary, the practical steps to really make the fundamental change in Nigeria in terms of safeguarding and child protection is really to help and raise awareness of safeguarding and child protection in all our schools. Secondly, to support the governing bodies and owners of schools, really to understand the, re the relationship between effective safeguarding and outcomes in education. The third, in terms of supporting teaching and learning in our schools, uh, again, by really introducing policies on safeguarding. Uh, my take again on this uh, conference this afternoon to educate children on the safeguarding rights and responsibilities is another way that we can actually get these up and running. So conference, uh, for me to conclude, uh, I think it's important really to recognize the value of safeguarding in effective education outcomes, to recognize these as a pull factor in terms of enabling Nigerian children really to get the best education. And in conclusion, uh, I would like to thank the Nigerian Schools Foundation for the opportunity to speak at today's virtual conference. I believe that we know what is required to deliver effective um, safeguarding arrangements in our schools in Nigeria based on what we collectively in this country do on a day-to-day -day basis. We simply cannot wait for change to happen at government level, as we know the effective safeguarding arrangements underpin our ability to meet the needs of our children and young people in education. So for me, conference for effective child protection and safeguarding measures remain a pool factor and contribute to the successful educational outcomes of our children. So please join me in making the required change happen. Once again, thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to discussing this important issue as part of our key questions and answers session. So once again, conference, let's really celebrate of the work of the NSF. Let's celebrate the real innovative way in addressing the fundamental issues facing our children in Nigeria. And thank you once again to the participants today and the NSF. Well, thank you. Good afternoon to all. Over to you, Charles. Well, th thank, thank, thank you very much, Adi. Um, uh, again, um, I wasn't surprised and I don't think colleagues on this call should be surprised. One thing I didn't say earlier on was um, Adi is the chief executive lead for children's services for the next two years on behalf of sellers, which across the country. Um, you've got some fans here, Adi. Someone, someone has just typed in sharing your surname and congratulating you. I didn't realize that you need to rent a mob to come and cheer up today. One of your residents, Yetunde, uh, Prince Will, is also congratulating you. I felt like saying to her, listen, she lives in the borough of Bromley. I know her very well. She doesn't need to congratulate. She just needs to pay her council tax so that you can pay my salary. <laughs> but but, 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 but uh, uh, apart from that, we move swiftly. Can I just remind colleagues again, please, 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 uh, put your questions in the chat there. Um, hopefully we'll be able to go through as many as possible. Keep the question as short as possible. I will be encouraging the speakers to keep the answers as short as possible. We can take as many questions. That takes me to, to the next speaker. We've, we've got the, the perspective from our neighbors in Ghana. You've heard from a, a Bromley perspective and a national perspective and the challenge Adi has thrown to us. We now move to Lagos State. You know what they call Lagos State? They say a code budget. No political pun intended though. But, and I've got the next speaker, a Mrs. Toyin Ido Awoshimi. She was born into education and she's grown into education and she's led education. 
Her father was the retired chief education officer in Lagos State. And one of the architects, the brains behind the current Lagos State Public Service. If it's good currently, it's not just done to this uh, fine lady who's gonna, we're gonna hear from, but also her father uh, who started the journey. She proud herself that she said she went to the best university in Nigeria. People might argue against that. She went to University of Ife, now called Abafemi Awolowo University. I'm sure there are colleagues around this conference call who went to Uniben like me who might disagree with her. Um, but apart from that, she, she um, graduated uh, um, um, uh, with a first degree, a master's in a field which is close to my heart um, um, and then developed into HR and public administration. She's a chartered member of the Institute of Personnel Management, which is part of my own background as well. But most importantly, uh, she became a permanent secretary in 2016. She's retired, but she's not tired. And you hear from her currently that the energy is still in her, even though she's retired. She doesn't look it. Uh, you might share. I know her age from her CV. I'm not going to share that with people on the on the on the conference call here, but she doesn't look her age at all. And and she's been a permanent secretary before she retired in a number of ministries. And interestingly, one of the people you work under was my senior and was the cousin of one of the speakers here today. Mr. Yaku Balogun, we used to call her Jogob. And a little bell tells me, my, a little bell tells me, Madam, that you also know one of my senior brother, Alaji, Alaji Onuwa, who mm. told me before today, once she saw your name, that I should be very careful with you and look after you. But the most important thing, I think you'll be sharing the legacy perspective with us and, and give uh, the, the legacy contest and possibly Nigerian contest and hopefully that will excite our colleagues here today. Over to you, Madam, for the next 15 minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I first of all want to appreciate um, the leadership of um, NSF. You're doing a great job. It could be better. And uh, that is why this conference is uh, put in place. Uh, without wasting much time, my name is Tonya Oshie. I retired meritoriously after 35 years in the service of Lagos State, 10 years as a classroom teacher, and uh, 25 years as um, an administrative officer, uh, rising from the lowest to the highest. And, I, and I, like I said, opportunities like this can only be in Lagos State. And so we're going to talk today about the physical and mental resilience through the pool or push factors in the education of youth and their fitness to succeed. Honestly, I think um, the leadership of NSF, they must have looked through a crystal ball as to choose this topic at this particular time. Like you all know what we're going through, our youth, what they're going through in the past 11 days in Nigeria. And so, Looking at it, um, basically, like you all know, everyone has the right to education and every child has the right to learn. No child should be left behind as every child's education matters. Education, be it informal or formal, is the process of facilitating learning or the acquisition of knowledge, skills, values, beliefs, and habits. Presently, the focus on education, be it universal, practical, and relevant, it should be to the need of the industry. And so education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world, according to Nelson Mandela. But honestly speaking, there is more to education than just the classroom setting. Now, moving on, who really are these young people? We are persons between the ages of 15 and 24 years. We have Generation Z and youth aged between 18 and 35 years, the millennials and the Generation Z. What do they need? What do they want? In the past, it was food, clothing, shelter but we've all come to see the realities of the 21st century that 
their needs are just there, but they are not limited to the right to education, the right to have a voice, which they are coming up strongly with in Lagos State and all over Nigeria now, the right to grow in a safe and inclusive environment, the right to gender equality, and the right to take over, but not replication. Move on. So I'm not going to waste our time on the pull and push factors in these young people, but we all know that generally the pull and push factors are those things that lead you positively, negatively, or apathy towards learning or attendance at school or leaving the school environment. There are those attractive versus repellent factors. I'm glad I heard that a lot of you on this platform, you are all, all students of notable schools in Nigeria and in Lagos State. So the pool factors, they are those things that attract people to a place or an activity and uh, learners are connected to attract and create communities of trust, knowledge sharing and healthy relationship. Learning occurs beyond the classroom environment. The institution provides access to information and people with approachable and friendly teachers. You all want to agree with me. If you have a friendly teacher, nobody wants to wake you up before you know you're going to school the next day. But if it is the other way around, they, 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 your children will give you one and a thousand excuses not to want to go to school. In this part of our world, the push factor reflects the force. And by the force, I think most of us went through this system of education, reflect the force on students to learn with no choice. In most cases, we memorized like um, the uh, Honorable Minister for Ghana said, you memorize. A lot of us, when they ask us what we have learned in the university, we don't really know it, but we've gone through the university. And so here we are today. The faculty is an expert. The teacher knows it all. Learners are isolated. It involves closed approach to learning. It is the traditional learning approach where learners are essentially informed of what and how much they must learn. If any child wants to raise his or her hands up to feel or think that, ah, the teacher is going the wrong way. I believe you all know what will happen to that uh, student. Is it that being flogged or being shouted down? You know? So today we're going to look at our resilience factor. Let's move on, please. How to acquire physical and mental resilience. There are really various schools of thought on resilience when it comes to young people. But my discussion will center on the physical and mental resilience of young people and the fitness to succeed. Honestly, there is no better time than this time to speak on this. Resilience is the ability to cope with negative life events and challenges. It is the capacity to bounce back from adversity. And adversity cannot be prevented but adversity can make one to, to bring out something good out of it. Example is the COVID-19 pandemic, which we all know has affected everyone in the world. It shut down the whole world. And been shutting us down in Nigeria, in Lagos State in particular, the orb of our economy, you know, it has brought a lot of these happenings. The sitting down at home of these kids, no school, nowhere to go, harassment here and there. They've come out with hashtag answers in Nigeria by youth who are in their need of being heard as they need a voice. I was looking through um, the social um, media and somebody analyzed what they meant by answers 
hashtag NSAS, education and economy reform. N for national constitution reform. D for debt accountability. S for security reform. A, anti-people policies cancellation. R, restructuring. And S, save, co save cost of governance. You'll all agree with me that we all need this in our country, Nigeria. These people, these young ones, physically and mental resilience of these young ones will require giving them much more than roots and wings to excel. They are speaking up where we cannot speak up. They are daring where we cannot dare. This is an example of their physical and mental resilience. Children who develop resilience are better equipped to cope with emotional challenges of school and life. And um, going further in Lagos states, permit me to speak a little bit about a state where I come from, a state where I know that the present administration, the administration of um, Mr. Governor, Mr. Babatunde, Babajide Olushola Sonwolu, has put in a lot. And part of his team's agenda is education and technology. I was listening to Mr. Ade, Ade, Ade Tosoye talking about um, uh, safeguarding. I want to tell you that in this administration, the Ministry of Justice has taken it up on itself with the backing of the state government to put in place a lot of laws for safeguarding of our children. In fact, for you to be a teacher in Lagos State now, in your appointment letter, it is clearly stated there, domestic and sexual violence law, which you have to take into cognizance as you teach our students in the public schools. Also, this administration has trained teachers, over 15,000 secondary school teachers. There is no teacher in the public school today who is not IT compliant. The Microsoft team had been, I mean, uh, appointed and they actually gave pro bono to all teachers in public schools in Lagos State. So that going forward, the teacher and the student, they'll be on the same platform. I think we need the, the, the present um, administration. Apart from that, there is improved infrastructure. The script is being brought back to revamp our schools. The furnitures are being replaced. The, um, the schools are being built, new schools are being built now with an um, internet component in it. Apart from that, the capacity building of our teachers is being taken with all pride and sense of responsibilities. So going forward, moving forward, all the domains of resilience is being taken into cognizance in uh, the lives of our young ones, the need for their control. You can see them out there, the different areas in Lagos, in Abuja, in Oweri, in Port Harcourt, in, they need a, 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 a united voice. I heard the Honorable Minister of Education saying that in America, from the classroom, students are being taught to know that America is the best country, nation in the world. We need things like this to go deep into our, our youths. We need them to, to have the competence. You need to be recognized when doing something right and giving opportunities to develop. If you look at the Twitter of um, Mr. Vice President, he apologized to these youths, you know? And he, he, he commended them, but they need to channel all this into a proper uh, way 
so that the result, we will get the basic result at the end of the day. Coping, you need to learn mechanism to manage their stress by learning methods to both engage and disengage when necessary. They need the confidence, yes. It comes from building real skills that parents and educators can teach and nurture. They also need the connection. Being part of a community helps the youth know that they are not alone if they struggle. We need their character. The youth need to have a character. The character must be there. I don't know those who look who watch the um, TV. I saw the youth being accountable. They said the money that has been forwarded to them, they were making accounts. They said that is what they expect us to do. After the old program at Lekki Tollgate, they were cleaning up. I think they, this, this, this youth, they need uh, more of our commitment on their part. Contribution, the experience of offering their own service makes it easier for you to ask for help when they need it, as you can see all over. Moving on, the physical resilience refers to the body's capacity to adapt to arising challenges, maintain stamina and strength in the face of demands. They are saying, until we get what we want, we're not, we're not I mean, leaving the spot. This should commence from their early childhood through regulating the sleeping culture of a child, time management as to when to study, regular exercise, eating healthy, interacting with other, others and getting a good night's sleep. Mentally, moving on, it is also the adoption of um, adopting well in the face of adversity, like I said earlier on. So how do these young ones develop this, res uh, this resilience and fitness to, to succeed? Because that is what I believe as alumni you want to hear. In this part of the world, like I said, the push factor is prevalent. Oftentimes they really don't have a voice in what they want, how they feel and how to go about their needs. The COVID-19 pandemic has taken its toll on our society with the emergence of this new normal, which has brought in various anxiety, unpreparedness on the part of the government, parents, community, youths, and the environment at large. It has affected all areas of our lives in every way. Mentally, it has brought in depression, anticipatory fear of being infected, which has negative impact on mental awareness of our people. The loss of loved ones have increased the rate of post-traumatic stress disorder during and after the pandemic. The isolation and lockdown has also affected the physical well-being, bringing in boredom, increased eating disorder, and domestic violence, to mention a few. Realistically, with the new normal, a lot of pull factors should now be put in place to assist the youth to be able to cope with the challenges of life. Moving on. This building physical and mental resilience by our youth are presently traumatized through the education system, security agencies, inequality, the learning gaps, the techie survey, other interests require a comprehensive approach by the government, corporate institution, NGOs, alumni association, parents, community students, and other stakeholders through the following but not limited suggestion all hands must be on deck in order to help the Nigerian youth. Moving on, government should embark on remodeling of the school curriculum, taking into consideration the job landscape of now and the future. By 2020, part of the 10 top emerging jobs will require creativity and artificial intelligence specialist, for example, data analyst and so on. Where are we? How are we helping this youth? There is, we need to have intensive use of technology in our schools. We need provision of more social workshops to promote strong social networks amongst youth in order to make them feel they have a family outside their immediate family. What has happened to the extracurriculum activities that all of us were part of when we were in school? 
We need to rejuvenate the Boy Scout, the Girls Guide, the Boys Brigade, the Red Cross, Creative Arts, Drama. These are all what we did when we were in school. These are things that actually brought in the, the seven domains of resilience in us. There is a need to resuscitate various elder sporting activities like the inter-house sports competition, inter-school competition, marathon race for youth, and development of sporting centers. We need to establish more technical schools to include more hands-on training, coding, programming, cybersecurity, blockchain technology. Can you believe that this youth in this their, um, 11 days have raised almost over 63 million on their own using various means. I mean, what are we talking about? They need, they are now getting smarter than all of us. So we all need to put on our thinking cap in order to deal with this youth. Can I, can I, can I come in please? Okay. Um, if I indulge you and the audience that we, we probably leave some of the presentation to the question and answer time. Um, without, is, that, is that okay with you, madam? The presentation to the end of yeah, it. So we, we take um, anything you might want to add further as part of the question and answer time. Let, let me yeah. just finish up. It's, All right, I'm almost you. done. I'm almost thank you. Done. Okay. So in order to help the resilience and fitness to succeed of our youth, I want us to look at them. Um, the youth themselves, they should engage in more exercise. They need to learn life and uh, they need to learn from their failures. They need to cultivate both humor and curiosity sensibilities. They need to have realistic expectation of self and life goals. And in concluding, I know there is no one fit all model for any policy to last. It must have a force behind it. A holistic approach with feedback system is very, very key. The impact of physical and mental resilience on the lives of young people to succeed in Nigeria is very enormous and tasking. The push effect are more visible and the feedback should be acted upon in a timely and measurable manner. I want to say thank you for bringing me on board. Thank you all and God bless. Oh, thank, thank you. I, I'm, I'm sure your father, who you took over, was the chief education officer, will be looking down on you from heaven and very proud of you. You mentioned thank first you. there. Something I didn't say at the beginning was you achieved so many firsts as a permanent secretary of the <laughs> Teaching Service Commission. First in terms of a thousand teachers being recruited, which colleagues might want to know. But more importantly, first in setting up uh, offering officers availability to the teacher teaching service staff development. A lot of the old students here, we want to find out more about that in terms of how we can tap into that resource. I know you've retired, but I said earlier on, I'm sure your connections are still there and you're not tired. So thank you, thank you so much. Uh, again, colleagues, if I remind you, um, I, I guess the feeling that people are enjoying it, the questions are just flowing in rapidly um, and we take as many as we can. Can I just plead with you um, that, um, I might indulge you just like me because I'm enjoying it. So we might stretch beyond two o'clock. I'm sure colleagues wouldn't mind. Coronation Street doesn't start at two. So I'm sure you can set us on that 10, 15 minutes for us, but probably no longer than that, but we'll see how we go. Um, to bring all this pull and push factor into reality, the things that happen in some of our homes and a lot of Nigerian parents at times we are in denial, that includes myself, about the pressure of having to raise our children in a foreign country, but also people back home having to raise their kids who are now more modern than when you and I went to school. We're gonna show you a video that just bring home to us some of the challenges parents have in trying to educate and educate in a rounded way, like Dr. Yao said. So technical team, can I have the two minutes video, please? Accident, all right? Toby, I am talking to you. Crime is like an addiction for you. You keep saying you'll quit. I am talking to you! Come on, what is it? My son. 
He's driving me crazy. Are you crazy? Yo, that's me? Huh? He's part of a gang. Yo, get the get out of the car! Get the get out of the car! You go out there with your so-called gang and you come home rich all of a sudden. And the next day richer and you expect me not to ask any questions. If you live in this house, you will abide by my rules or you get out and stay out forever. Look, all I got to do is this last job. Come on, just one last job. You don't get it, do you? Good man, yo. I spoke to Alyssa. How's she doing? She's pregnant. What? What the f can I do for you? Wrong choice of words. Get the f out of the car. Drop the weapon now. Put your hands against the car. Huh? What you do that for? Ben, please rise. Jury, on the charge of first degree murder, have you reached the verdict? Thank, thank you, thank you very much. That might be the extreme end of what some parents might experience in their um, homes. But I bet a lot of parents, and I said including myself, will have experienced some some level of dissatisfaction with our kids. And I say to you today, if you are a parent, you've listened to Adia de Tosoye, the one thing you don't do, do never, never, never give up on your child. I'm sure many of us as parents, as mothers and fathers, we've shed tears because we probably been disappointed by the progress of our kids. It's not how well you started, it's how well you finished. So therefore, stay. And I say to people, the day I give up on my son or my daughter is the day I should be called a fatherless child. Because absolutely, it's absolutely important you stand by, I've shared tears, and I'm sure some of you have shared tears. We play that video as a precursor to the next presentation. Because the next presentation brings into light the video you've just seen. It's all about the needs group not in education, not in employment, not in training. It's absolutely important to understand the effects of youth crime on a, on, on, on a child's development and life chances. And I'm gonna bring a speaker to you. I, I, I'm cheating here. I was fortunate to listen to her as part of a rehearsal. I was just wowed, the X factor. I could listen to this presenter all day long. And I'm sure you will be disappointed. Her name is Indidi a dozy answer. Unlike the other speakers whereby I made up the presentation, introducing them on my own, I don't want to do an injustice to her. So I'm going to read out a very short thing she said. She described herself as a British Nigerian with 20 years experience as an educator and a leader. Her experience is gained in a variety of sectors, including third sector, youth offending institutions and private. Holds a master's degree in psychological studies, which I wasn't surprised and currently undertake independent research into the overarching barriers that hinder positive social mobility among young people. She is a teacher, a mentor, a life coach, and has done so much with children and young adults at risk of social exclusion. Her work includes content editing and subject matter, expert consultancy for tech startup and promoting access to education. On that note, Please join me in welcoming Indidi. Um, when I joke with Alas, I say Kedukodi, as we say in Igbo. Oh, the floor is yours, madam, for the next 15 minutes. Brother Charles Odema, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to share my screen, but I'm unable to do that at the moment. Okay, just a second, I'll, let, I'll give you the permission to do so. You can now share your screen, Andy, there. Thank you. Oh, great. Of course, sod's law. <laughs> now I want to share my screen. What I need to share is not there. Let's try again. Oh, 
gosh. Can can uh, Mr. Rashid share it on your behalf? You're, you, you're mute. Or probably you should just uh, carry on the way you did at the rehearsal. If that's okay. I know, I need, oh gosh, what's happened? <laughs> Sorry. I can't even see my, um, oh, here we are. Sorry. This is not good. Do you want to just uh, play the, um, if you want to put the screen up, for some reason I can't, I can't share it. It's not working, sorry. And we'll try and just go through it together. You, you have some screens of which we are aware. Can you see my screen? Negative. I'm not sharing anything, so I don't know what's happened. But if you've got my presentation, you can put it up. For some reason, I can't, I can't share the screen. So I don't know why that is. It's not a problem. Um, Rashid, do you have the presentation or maybe Remy, someone? Was that very strange? Someone got the presentation, please. Mr. Daniel, Mr. Daniel, can you? I can hear you. Okay. Um. Uh, while we start out uh, into this session, uh, can you play the uh, video of the of the runner hop? The runner, please, yeah, from the you mean, uh, Baptist Academy. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, thank you. Mm. That should be Roger. Is Regan? Shall... Regan, please, not Regan. Yeah. Thank you. I'm able to share now, it looks like. Okay. That's great. Sorry. That's, that's okay. You can know what I say about it? Yeah, we can Sorry. see you. <laughs> okay, let's get going. I'll jump straight into it. I'm gonna be talking about the cause and effects of youth crime and neat groups. Um, on the premise that every child indeed does matter, I'm glad to be surrounded by individuals who I, feel or believe, feel about education the way that I do in that education does have the power to bring about a just and peaceful and purposeful world. So I'll start with a statement. I'll say that society is flawed and by default, our what? education system is failing our children, these particular children. We only need to consider Hello. the um, extent of the rise in youth crime all across the world. In the UK alone, there's been a surge of articles on knife crime. And yeah. we know through research that there is a correlation between oh, who's youth, we know that there is a correlation between youth unemployment and youth crime. And if we look at the stats in the UK, 11% of our young people are considered not in education, employment or training. And 62% of them, which is just under 500,000 young people are considered economically inactive. And what that means is that there is no indication from these young people that they want to work or prepare for work, that they want to contribute positively to the economy. And you'll find that over 50% of these people are from black and ethnic minorities. And if we look at Nigeria stats, it's much worse. It's a much more popular country, it's densely populated. 18% um, of the young people there, which is just under 7 million, are not in education, employment or training. 
and 21% of those are considered economically inactive. Now, I've worked a lot with young people in this category, and I can tell you that they are not economically inactive. They are very active. It's just that their activity is illegal. And so with rising unemployment comes rising youth crime. And with rising youth crime comes social exclusion as more and more young people begin to operate under the radar because they are disengaged, because they are disenfranchised through a lack of opportunity. And now they are apathetic towards any form of authority or politics, which can change things. And often we forget about the vulnerabilities of these young people. We, or it's easier to label them as criminals and put them in prison, throw away the key and observe them from a distance. But it's unfortunate because if you consider the term Ubuntu, which is a South African Zulu term, meaning I am because you are, or I am because we are, then really to exclude one is to exclude them all. And I'll be looking at the cause and effect using psychosocial theory because that's one that I'm familiar with. And it's one that I feel lends itself to the term Ubuntu. But when I speak of the psychosocial, I don't refer to psychosocial in terms of mental health, which you may have heard before, where it looks at the combination of psychological and sociological treatment for those with mental health uh, problems. The psychosocial I mean looks at or identifies a relationship, a marriage between the human psyche and the social psyche, whereby there is an understanding that society itself has a mind and the social mind creates and recreates the human mind, and the human mind creates and recreates the social mind. And so this relationship, this interactive creative relationship gives birth to new ways of thinking, new thoughts, new principles, new theories about individual and social development. So it's not merely a combination of the psychological and the sociological. Psychosocial theory does draw from these two schools of thought, but it also draws from other schools of thought, such as neuroscience and humanities and philosophy. But today I'll look at two key principles when it comes to psychosocial theory and understanding the cause and effects of youth crime. The first is likened to the iceberg, whereby the cause is that which lurks beneath. It's the part that people can't see. And in psychosocial terms, we will call this the unconscious, which is a term that was coined by Sigmund Freud, a psychoanalyst back in the early 1900s. Now, Sigmund Freud believed that human beings had mental content that was repressed, content that was traumatic, uh, things like uh, traumatic events or memories or really painful emotions or really negative thought processes that really could never rise to our consciousness because if they were to come into our consciousness, it would cause mental collapse. So it remained beneath the surface. We were unaware of it. However, it did impact or it does impact on our behavior in the external world, which is the part that people can see. Now in this diagram, I've tried to show the connection between, or the correlation between cause and effect, whereby the effect is just as much contributed, contributory to the cause as the cause is contributory to the effect. The second principle looks at the structure of the unconscious, especially in the social world, whereby it adopts the model of the family structure, the traditional family hierarchical structure where you have a father, a mother, and a child, which we can also liken to the superego, the ego, and the id. These are terms that you may have heard of before. So this is what the human psyche looks like. This is what it's structured like, where you have the superego, which is the part of our minds where you draw your, uh, your values, where you are able to decipher what is right or wrong. I call this the judge. And then you have the ego. The ego is the part that negotiates between the superego and the id so that it can present a unified human identity, a social identity that is accepted in society. And then you have the id. The id is your inner child. It's instinctive. It's there to explore. It's there to learn and to grow. It's from your id that you draw your creativity, that you draw your authentic spirit. But sometimes the ego has to keep the id in check because often our instincts don't always correspond with social expectation. And therefore our id doesn't always correspond with our superego because we draw our value system from the external world. So if we were to consider then logically, it makes sense to have a superego in the external world that mirrors our own internal superego. 
And so in the external world, we will identify the superego as the father. The father represents the rules. He's the rule giver. The father is the one who provides the discipline and therefore validates the child and helping the child understand what is right and wrong. The father also provides the environment with which the child will flourish, with which the child will learn and develop. But often we know with our young people in this category, fathers are absent. Uh, fathers can be destructive even. And so there's a breakdown there or failure on the social um, side to uh, mirror or reflect back to the child what is right and what is wrong. You can also identify the superego as the educational institution for the reasons that I've listed here. But often we know that, especially when it comes to working with young people in this category who may exert certain behaviors that the educational institution cannot manage, they get excluded. So educational institutions are exclusive. Therefore, there being another failure in the social ego. And then you could associate the social super ego, sorry, uh, with the government, with its policies and, and law and order, etc. But then again, there's a failing here where the government, you could consider that the government is absent or is uh, inattentive or destructive in some way, whereby, you know, political ideologies do not serve our young people or do not serve the child. And in the same way you have a social superego, you also have a social ego, which we will identify as the mother. Now, the mother's role, much like the superego internally facilitates between the, uh, much like the ego facilitates between the superego and the id, the mother facilitates between the father and the child. But it's the child that grows, it's the child that's there to develop. So the attention should be on the child. The mother should be responsible, responsive to the child and feed the child. But often we know that mothers in this area, mothers for these youths are often single in the UK, um, tired, overstretched, overwhelmed. And so the mother develops a weak ego in herself, which is now mirrored in her child. The mother or the ego in society can also be classified as the teacher or the practitioner for the same reasons that I've listed there. Teachers and practitioners also do the work of the ego to mirror onto the child as the child develops their ego. But often teachers are um, sometimes under-resourced, sometimes underskilled, also overwhelmed with work, overworked, et cetera. So there's a failing there in the social psyche to provide the environment that the child needs to grow. And then finally, you have the child. And like I said before, the child is instinctive. The child is there to learn and to grow. Imagine a baby when a baby is born for the first time and it instinctively knows how to breathe or it instinctively knows how to latch onto its mother's breast for a feed. That's the role of the child, is to learn from society so that it can grow into a sense of itself and then present a unified self to society in a way that they will now contribute to society so that society can then reflect back to them what is just, what is peaceful, what is purposeful. But the reality is there is a poverty. There is a poverty of finance. There's a poverty of positive experiences. There is a poverty of opportunities within the social system. And this in the first instance is down to the failing of the superego for the reasons that I've mentioned earlier. And this relationship between the human, the young person and the social superego is traumatic as a result. The social, the social superego fails to provide a healthy uh, social ego, a happy, motivated mother or a happy, motivated, well-skilled teacher or a system that allows them to do their work uh, positively for the child. And sometimes the mothers also themselves have weak egos. And so this weak ego is now being mirrored in the child. And there's trauma there as the child develops negative attachments towards the ego, the external ego. And like I mentioned, the child is meant to grow, the child is meant to develop a, a, a strong ego so that they can facilitate between social expectation and their own instinctive impulses. But they can't do this because they haven't had the correct examples shown from, the, from society to take in and to build. And what happens here is this child becomes at risk, this child becomes vulnerable, this child now to, starts to exert certain behaviors that educational institutions can't cope with. And this is fertile ground for perpetrators who want to groom young people 
into child sex sexual exploitation or child criminal exploitation. And that's in itself is a, a trauma. So now we have a breakdown. There's a disconnection in the social psyche. So things aren't working cohesively in our society. And then there's a mirroring disconnection in the human psyche, where now you have a young person who has a warped sense of what is right and wrong because of how the su social superego has presented and who is, has a, a weak superego to be able to facilitate what is right or wrong according to society with their own desires or their own impulses, internal impulses. But then most of all, you now have a, a breakdown in that relationship, in that marriage that I spoke of earlier, where there's almost, it's almost like there's nothing that we can do in the external world to uh, merge or to uh, develop or, or repair, sorry, the damage that has been done with the human psyche from childhood as the child has been growing. And so this leads to a divorce. So I guess the question now is where do we go from here? And it's good that we're here having these discussions. And if we go back to the term Ubuntu, I am because we are, which ultimately means that people are who they are because of other people, then this in itself is the motivator for us to change really our system. And I believe, and I'm sure some of you do too, that teaching and, and learning is a key process in any educational system. And I believe that there is really no better way than to review our systems using the psychosocial lens. It will, need, it will help us rethink our policies, it will help us rethink our curriculum and our pedagogy. And having had a head start in this area, I can tell you that it will take a lot of courage to be able to make the kind of changes that steer away from what is currently the norm and what isn't working. I'll say one more thing, I'll just leave, the, leave us at this. When a young person is excluded, it is not the fault of the young person. It's not even the fault of the family or the communities around them. It's not the fault of the educational institution or the government per se, but everybody has contributed to that child's exclusion in the same way that everybody can contribute to the child's re-inclusion and the child's development into a strong social being that will contribute to the world in a positive way. Thank you. Back to you, Brother Charles. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you so much. Um, uh, and I'm sorry about the technology earlier. Oh, you know what I say about technology? <laughs> it's, um, it's very good for us, um, but every now and then um, they just disappoint us. But, your presentation did not disappoint me. I'm sure it did not disappoint um, our colleagues on the conference call. Absolutely brilliant. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and um, hopefully colleagues, please, again, just on that reminder, keep asking questions on the chat bar and we take as many as possible. Um, that's a logic to how we structured the whole day in terms of the synergy and especially in terms of the four pool factors. So we've seen the safeguarding, we've talked about the physical and mental health, um, resilience, and we now talked about, uh, indeed this presentation around um, the impact of crime and, and, and um, the needs um, thing as a whole. We've listened to the adult perspective. Isn't it about time we listen to the young perspective? After all, the conference today is about our young people. And I think someone said, there are days tomorrow. I don't believe that, there are days today. They are today's leaders. The whole idea of saying they are tomorrow's leader is a way of delaying, especially in Nigeria, we just delay their progress. Their time is now, which is why Mrs. Awushi said earlier on, things are happening in Nigeria now. Call it revolution, call it evolution. Our young people, uh, leaders of today, never mind of tomorrow. Um, I've got a young lady who's going to give us um, a perspective for just under 10 minutes. I salute her and I salute her courage and her Spartan courage to put herself forward to be part of this impressive lineup of adult people. She's great. Her name is Shade Yemit, Yemiton. Shade means coolness, if she doesn't know. Yemi means befit me. It befits her to be part of this August panel, August speakers. Um, so, so therefore, 
be proud of yourself. I'm sure your parents, if they are part of this conference call, are very proud of you. I'm very proud of you. Uh, at your age, I wasn't quite sure if I had the bottle or the confidence to be able to uh, hold my own. So I look forward, I look up to you. Um, I, I love your CV, it's absolutely brilliant. So from Townley Grammar School in Bexley Heath, it's a little disappointing you should have come to Bromley, the better grammar schools in Bromley and Bexley Heath. So we can argue that later. But most importantly, I saw your interest in computer and technology. And interestingly, um, your interest in setting up a business with your sibling about hair accessories. I'm not quite sure, um, um, I'll look, look at my hair. I don't know if you can see my hair. I don't know what you can do in terms of my rounded hair with no hair, but I'm sure you can sell some products for me to make more money. Absolutely brilliant. Your future is clear, your future is orange. You've said your future for you is about coding and computer. Boy, oh boy, it sounds like a brain surgeon. Over to you, Shadi. Thank you for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shadi Emerson and I'm 15 years old in year 10. I attend Townley Grammar School. Um, for my GCSE options, I chose computer science, history, French and design technology, um, in addition to the other mand mandatory subjects. I enjoy computing and I hope to pursue a career in coding and computing. Today, I'm going to be talking about how the pandemic affected me as a student. The pandemic, where would I even start? With the forest fires in Australia or people fighting over toilet paper in shops, the death of Kobe Bryant and his daughter or the death of George Floyd, the BLM movement or the continuous genocide, conversation camp, conversion camps and several other violations of human rights around the world or most importantly, the major global impacts COVID-19 had across the globe. This pandemic could be one to remember, as I'm sure it would be for all. And to think all that happened and for, and for some is still happening in just a few months. So, what did it, so how did it affect me and my academic studies? Most of us were excited for the pandemic and it seemed like a few extra days or weeks away from school that would get added onto our Easter break. But the days slowly turned into weeks and the weeks turned into months. And before you knew it, we had another lockdown from, for about half a year. For me as a student, the pandemic had a very imp heavy impact on my education. Doing work felt more like an option when in reality it was still mandatory. As much as my school tried its best to try and make everything as easy and accessible as possible, there was always going to be a few hiccups along the way. My mum was great help constantly making sure my siblings and I woke up on time to start our schoolwork and check in what we had done for the day. My school used Google Classroom and our school emails as a way to communicate. This meant that I was constantly bombarded with emails from teachers sending us homework, classwork and codes to join some of the classrooms on Google Classroom. Sometimes key informa information would get lost in the massive pile of emails. For example, my physics teacher sent an email the code to join the Google Classroom where he'd set us, set us work. But I didn't see his email. And he emailed my parents saying I hadn't joined the class. And as you could imagine, I got into a lot of trouble. We were expected to follow our normal school timetable. All work assigned had a deadline to try and keep everyone organized. But teachers were completely understanding if you were struggling and needed an extension. Getting in contact with teachers wasn't always so easy, meaning sometimes I had to wait a while for a response, which meant for a few cases I couldn't complete some of my work or had to message my classmates for help. Work was mainly sent online, whereas for my sister's school, they had constant Zoom classes, making it easier for her to communicate with her teachers there and then. Doing tests was extremely easy as it wasn't under any supervision. So we could call our friends or do research for help during the test, which meant they were a lot stricter of the marking. So we would have random checkups on Zoom, either with our head of year or our form tutor. These sessions were a time where we could catch up with everyone and see how everyone was coping during the, the unfortunate conditions. As much as we followed our school timetable, we were able to finish work faster as there wasn't any other distractions or discussions. It was just me and my screen. My mum tried to get us to do some reading or a bit of extra work to try and fill up time so we didn't finish school so early. Still left with a lot of free time. 
How did I spend my free time? I love baking for my family and friends. So during the pandemic, I decided to build on my baking skills. I learned how to bake a carrot cake, banana cake, churros, and improved my cookie recipe, my vanilla and lemon cake recipes. And I also attempted making a chocolate cake, which failed terribly, but I'll try making it again soon. My sister and I took it upon ourselves to learn some new recipes and cook for our family, which didn't look like it was a fun experience. We also started an accessories and beauty business, a hair accessories and beauty business, where we sell lip gloss, lip scrub, eyebrow brushes, and handmade hair bonnets that my sister makes herself as she loves to set. When we returned to school, we were able to sell to those of us classmates. But to summarize, the pandemic was a time for self-reflection and to build on some more of my personal skills. It was also lots of fun spending more time with my family. Although there were a few arguments of my siblings after being cooped up for such a long time together, I'm glad to, be, to finally be back at school and interact with my school friends and others from the outside world. Thank you. Um, thank, thank, you thank you very much, um, Shadi. Um, that was absolutely brilliant. I hope your mom wasn't like my mom. My mom used to say to me, look how we are your I hope you understand that you were there. But if you don't, I'm sure your mom would translate that for you. Absolutely brilliant. Unlike the adult presenters, I'm going to be give you a heads up in terms of the question and answer time. There's a question coming through, so you've got time to think about it. How did you cope with the massive emails, the suite of emails from your teacher during the pandemic period? But Thank you so much. And I'm gonna ask everyone, I hope you do it in your private, wherever you're listening to, to be upstanding and applause this young lady who is our future and we should be proud of her of, because of her Nigerian heritage. Thank you very much, Shadi. Um, moving on moving on very quickly, um, because of time pressure, there's a video we wanted to share with you, which is student's teacher. Um, it, it, um, some of you might have seen it, it went viral. Have a look at it. It brings into uh, into the reality of some of the discussion we're having today, especially the presentation by Dr. Yao when she he was challenging us about moving away from cognitive mental knowledge. You and I, in those days, we stand on the assembly. We have to memorize two times two, four, two times three, six, and all that. But the education did not provide me with the curiosity and the challenge. There are different ways of learning. That video we share with you a very, very poignant discussion between the teacher and the people and the mother. So have a look on the internet. We'll probably post it on NSF video. Okay. We'll moving on, now. moving on. We'll Sorry, we'll can, you, can you stop that please? Can you stop that? Can you stop that please? So, uh, so colleagues, please, you can watch that later at your leisure. Um, that would have been brilliant to prefix the next presentation, which is the next presentation it's exactly what you will have seen that video. It's exactly what Dr. Yao was talking about in terms of thinking outside of the box, traditional one size fits all versus creative thinking and leadership development. How do you develop a rounded child to be part of a society? You know what I said about education? Give a child education and you close the prison door. It's absolutely important. And I'm going to introduce a colleague of mine. I was privileged to be um, part of his um, selection process and appointment in Bromley Council. His name is Gerard Nehru. He's our director of education. But I'm a bit disappointed because before he came to Bromley Council, I was a peanut boy of Bromley Council. But since he came, he's relegated me down. He's now the new peanut boy of Bromley. And you probably know why in a minute. He's the director of education, London Borough of Bromley, the biggest geographical local authority in Greater London. And he spent his entire life working on education with education, both in Kent County Council, which is a very massive county council, and London Borough of Red, uh, Redbridge. Gerard, the floor is yours for the next 10, 15 minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Charles. And uh, I shall uh, certainly try and live up to uh, yeah, the, that introduction. Uh, very difficult to uh, follow Sade, so uh, I, I think I've got perhaps the uh, the graveyard slot here. So, but but really, um, firstly, a huge thank you to the Nigerian Schools Foundation for hosting this important conference. Um, as you've heard, my name is Jared Nera. 
and I've been lucky to serve as the Director of Education at the London Borough of Bromley since January of 2019. And I'm really delighted to be here with you today to discuss the importance of pedagogy as an integral educational tool for our schools and colleges, to support our pupils and students in achieving their academic goals to the best of their abilities. And I would also like to take this opportunity to share with you some of my key priorities and those that I share with other education leaders in Bromley and how we're taking these forward. At the London Borough of Bromley, we're committed to promoting the well-being of our children and young people in education. The child growing up in Bromley should have access to a high quality education offer, a school or college where they feel safe, resilient and eager to learn and develop their skills in line with the life they want to build for themselves in the future. Now these principles are important at any time, but at this time of national crisis, an international crisis, with this dreadful virus, they're of paramount importance to ensure that the generation of children is not left behind, and crucially that the most vulnerable in our society are prioritised. When the UK went into its first lockdown, the majority of children and young people were working from home, much like their parents. The shift in the approach teachers and students had to take in order to work collaboratively on continuing their learning journey during this time was simply remarkable to bear witness to. And I place on record my huge thanks for the passion and commitment of leaders, teachers and support staff during this unprecedented period. However, we must not forget the impact of staying locked in at home during this time, as we've heard Sade talk about, and, and I'll return to this uh, in a moment. Those that have uh, struggled to adjust to the many changes in their daily routines. We know that many families became more vulnerable during this period, and that families that we, as a local authority, were not actively working with before the pandemic, now came up on our radar. For many, it was a realisation of how important our schools and teachers are in providing pedagogy and support for our children to achieve the best of their capabilities. And they do this best through a broad, balanced and enriched curriculum. In my speech today, I'd like to talk about three key points in relation to pedagogy and our current situation as we approach the October half term in 2020. Firstly, I'm going to start with the impacts of COVID and the lockdown on disadvantaged students. Now, of course, we've just been very lucky to hear a personal account and, and the powerful words from Sade and the, on the impact that COVID has had on her and on her learning. That's a, a very tough act to follow, as I say, but I'd like to add some of my own thoughts. For our children and young people, missing face-to-face -face learning, spending time with their peers in a safe school environment was a massive change to their routines and to their social and academic development. Many of the disadvantaged pupils did not have access to the internet, a de device of their own to work from or to get in touch with their teachers or peers. And if there's one thing that we're all likely to agree on, it would be that the impact of COVID-19 has not been equal. COVID-19 and the measures to contain it have had a disproportionate impact on children and young people's mental health and well-being, especially the most vulnerable in society. All pupils must benefit from the same high expectations, assumptions, for example, those about lower achievement and poor behaviour of different groups of pupils in schools. Those are assimilated by pupils and over time, the students come to achieve at the level expected of them, thus creating the Pygmalion effect and self-fulfilling prophecy of underachievement and poor behaviour. Support from trusted adults, a sense of belonging, routine and structure was reported by Bernardo's to be some of the main things that have kept children and young people mentally well and ready to learn during the pandemic. More on that uh, in a moment. So how can the way in which teachers and peers support each other influence that disadvantage gap that we know is such a priority and, and has grown during this period? We know from research and feedback from our Bromley Closing the Gap project that disadvantaged children and young people make accelerated learning progress when the relationships between the adults and children are positive and strong. Now, of all the interventions, all the many interventions used to narrow gaps across Bromley, this was evidently the most effective and interesting also one of the cheapest. 
With that in mind, I encourage all school leaders to invest in their pastoral support, to take the time to personally know their children and families. It has the greatest return on investment they will ever see. I would also encourage all educational settings to ensure that all staff undertake regular peer support sessions to have a safe place for raising concerns and suggest different approaches and how to reach out and improve teacher-student relationships. I'd like to speak briefly now about Black Lives Matter and unconscious bias. Now, of course, we were all truly horrified to witness the brutal killing of George Floyd, nearly nine painful minutes so unconscionable that shockwaves were felt around the world. In uniting to denounce racism, the hope is that his death continues to serve as a catalyst for change around the world. Now, I see this uh, quote's already been used, but Nelson Mandela once said, education is the most powerful weapon which we can use to change the world. And never has this been more critical. In Bromley, under the leadership of the chief executive, we're all challenging one another to increase equality and diversity in all that we do. In respect of education, we believe its purpose is to transcend limitations, including those due to the unconscious bias that exists in society. The local authority and Bromley schools believe that every young person through access to the best education should be able to achieve their full potential, regardless of background or circumstances. No child's outcome should be defined by the colour of their skin, their gender, socioeconomic background, sexual orientation or any other characteristic. We understand the crucial part schools and settings play in addressing the systemic racism that exists in society and Bromley leaders acknowledge that there are uncomfortable truths to face to achieve our goal of removing unconscious bias from all schools and settings in the local area. Now, I'm truly heartened that Bromley head teachers and the local authority are determined to seize this pivotal moment to challenge themselves and drive real change, having agreed that equality and diversity and conscious, uh, unconscious bias is a key priority for the 2021 academic year. It's vital that we as a local authority and in partnership with our schools provide pupils with a rich global curriculum to prepare fully rounded young people to join a globally mobile workforce. We endeavour to look closely, uh, closely at the curriculum in schools with a clear focus on what is taught, the texts used in English and history in particular, to ensure a range of voices and viewpoints are heard, thus providing a broader intellectual vision and a more shared experience of our common history for all peoples. We must challenge ourselves in our roles as professionals in education to take responsibility, to be a critical friend and to always challenge and support one another to do better. Let us encourage our students to be critical thinkers and raise the question, would the other side of this event tell a different story than what is presented to us? And lastly, I'd just like to spend a little time talking about mental health and well-being. In Bromley, the mental health and well-being of our staff, pupils and their families is always a priority. In these uncertain times, I and other senior leaders have sought to, what I call, double down on this area. We're working closely with our schools and health partners and have established a trailblazer scheme to enable earlier access to mental health professionals in Bromley. We're also actively working in partnership with the Anna Freud Centre and other voluntary sector partners to provide effective training and development for education professionals, both to develop their own resilience and to be able to identify mental health concerns at the earliest opportunity. Now we know that children and young people that suffer with their mental health and well-being will typically be identified in school. During lockdown many opportunities for these students getting help were lost and many suffered from the rigid restrictions the pandemic brought at its peak. In Bromley we acted quickly to ensure that vulnerable families were supported with phone calls every week and offers of essentials like food and medicine. Nevertheless, fear and anxiety are probably the most common emotional responses any of us will feel as we've slowly come out from lockdown and as we head, sadly, into the second wave. Finding a way to pull ourselves through lockdown took a lot of our emotional energy and we know that some people will continue to need our support. It's important to be mindful that our children and young people also need patience from us to get through this time. Education remains the great enabler and with the passion and commitment of leaders and professionals, we can support our families through this most difficult of times while striving to ensure every child meets his or her potential. 
In conclusion, I'd, I'd like to thank again the Nigerian Schools Foundation for inviting me to speak at today's conference. I, I'm honoured to, to be here. Pedagogy and education can be so varied, but it truly underpins the way in which we equip our children, our future in approaching the world and their lives after leaving school. Getting this right has never been more important than in today's uncertain world, but we must and we will continue to rise to this challenge together. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Gerard. And I know why London based borough, which is Bromley, uh, was fortunate to have you. So thank you for that. Uh, and colleagues, we now move um, uh, as seamlessly as we can to the panel session. But before we do, just to bring into reality, as I said earlier on, about the, the presentation we just had, colleagues have impressed on me that we could have a shortened version of the video we didn't play earlier on even though we're mindful of time. So the technical IT people, can you pull that video through halfway, please? Thank you. See many top companies today don't look at grades. Mom, that old way is expiring. Google has been quoted as saying, GPAs are worthless criteria for hiring. Founder of Tesla, Elon Musk agrees. So I say this with unease and sorrow. If you continue to teach today as you taught yesterday, then you rob us students of tomorrow. Mr. Johnson, I'm gonna keep it real with you. Sometimes sitting in your class is tough. I'm constantly thinking if I don't look up at the clock, maybe it'll speed up. So I listen to you do my work and pay attention, feeling like an hour had to have gone by, but it was only three minutes. So if you wonder why we're bored in class, look, you wanna get a kid to hate reading? Give them this, a school textbook. And some people think it's our fault and that hurts me. They say you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And to that I say no. Firstly, you can put salt in that horse's hay and make him thirsty. And if you bring joy in your classroom, you can make any bad student nerdy. As he or she discovers the beauty of truly learning. Mr. Johnson, I mean no disrespect. You have the most important job on this planet. You build, create, and save lives. But if you really care about my future, like you say, then you have to fully commit and ask yourself honestly, how do I prepare a child for a future that doesn't yet exist? Here's a hint. The answer is not found in this. It's using this and this. See, in the future, we will need more passion and compassion. People with inspired hearts and wisdom to uplift this planet. And mom, I love you, but can I be real? Go ahead. You wanna know one of the biggest factors for childhood success? It's not IQ. It's family meals. And we haven't had one of those in a while. See, I know sometimes you don't feel proud because I may not be a straight A student, but I'm not stupid. These tests may be 70% of my grade, but they're 0% of my future. But don't worry, I'll pass this class and get through this. But I need you to give me the space I need to be me and live true. Because the best feeling in the world is that your own parents get you. There's a passage in a book called The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. And if you don't mind, I'd love to share it with you. Go ahead. See, he says, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, they do not belong to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts. For they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow. So mom, I'd appreciate it if you give me the love that I need to pursue my dreams. See, if we are to succeed, all three of us need behavior change on all fronts. We talk about the future, but the future is now, and it is created now by all of us. I've never heard you speak like that before. Yeah, I didn't know. But I'm going to reach out to administration and try to change some things. You have my word. Thank you. Thank you. I hope, um, colleagues, if you find time to watch the whole video, it's quite powerful. There are lessons for us because most of us are parents here. Yeah? One is to love your child 
whatever they are and keep believing them, believe in them, believe in them, believe in them, even though you feel disappointed, just believe in them because it's not about today, it's about tomorrow. The second point was what Gerard talked about, what uh, Dr. Yao talked about, it's about our curiosity. It's about developing differently. A lot of us are obsessed with sending our kids to formal education, university, whatever the university is. What about the apprenticeship route? What about kids who just believe in hands-on education? And I said to someone, if I, re if I re believe in reincarnation, I come back again. I might just want to be a plumber or an electrician because I probably make more money than what I've been paid currently. And I think it's quite important to, to move away from the traditional way of learning. I was a lecturer for many years in Nigeria um, and I could tell some of my students, they just memorized. And I did the same thing when I was preparing myself for my degree, for my master's and for my A-level, just memorize. And you just wonder where did I take some of the students and myself at the later years rather than creating that creative young person. So thank you. We, so, some of those questions will come up again and um, and again and again, because I've seen some of the questions in the chat bar. If we now move into, into the question and answer, like I said earlier on, I'm gonna plead with you um, in the sense that if you can spare us an, an extra 10 minutes or so beyond two o'clock, because there's been such a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant um, seminar and conference, and I'm sure colleagues will agree with me. Um, I wish we took the courage to make it an all day uh, but, but at the same time, we we're mindful that we didn't want people to uh, think it's a long virtual seminar. But I've just enjoyed every minute from the first presenter, the, uh, Dr. Yao, to Adia Detosoye, to Mrs. Awoshi, to Indidi, to Jared, and, and above all, to Shadi. They will form part of our Q&A panel right now. Joining them as well will be Bimbo Babarinde, who is the Chief Operating um, officer for NSF and Bimbo, um, uh, Bimbo, uh, sorry, Wale Sonwu, who is the, one of the directors, and Dr. Remy. They will form this virtual panel in terms of taking questions. Without much ado, and I hope um, Bimbo and, um, and um, Wale are ready. Uh, one of the first questions for, for the leadership is, is, is about why has NSF not been able to get other schools to be part of this big, wonderful umbrella? I'm quite happy for Bimbo or Wally to take that question, please. Um, can I take it? Oh, yeah, can I just, can I, can I play with panel member, please? Try and keep your answer as short as possible so we can go through many questions. And also, uh, in order to get many questions through, I'll be working in partnership with my colleague, Tola Yeni. So as we ask the question, Tola will be finding the second question and she'll be spotlight so that we can move as quickly through the Q&A. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Charles. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, I'll try and answer that very quickly. Um, great question, great observation. Um, in our eight years of existence, we've traveled in size from 17 to 51. Um, we're open to all schools in Nigeria. Uh, and in fact, we are across the five out of the six geopolitical zones. So I note that uh, we're mainly in the Southwest. Um, thousands of secondary schools in Nigeria. Uh, so we think it's an opportunity. It's not for the lack of time. We think it's a good opportunity for us. Um, mm -hmm. We're pretty young, just eight years, and we keep trying to make um, good strides there. Um, you know, yeah, great, great question, great observation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for um, that succinct answer to the very important question. Uh, Tola, do you have a question on the bag you want to raise? Okay, I have a question from um, Falaka Shegun, who's, ooh, this question is directed to um, Dr. Yo. Um, she's commenting on his recommendation for um, critical thinking, but she feels that, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a society like Nigeria, where the Nigerian child is to be seen and not heard, so how do you then marry that with um, critical thinking? So that's for Dr. Yo. Yeah, I, I'm just getting uh, real time information that Dr. Yao may have dropped off because he's, uh, are you still there, sir? Yes, I'm here. All right, okay, thank you. So do you want to take the question, please? 
Yeah, I, I, I think the critical thing is that our education system should make up for what we think is deficient in society. So if the curriculum design does not take account of that, then we are selling the schools short, selling the children short. So that is why it is more in that situation, on the, on, it's more on us as the leaders of the education system to recognize that if you don't do something through your curriculum development, through your instructional uh, development process, you are not going to make amends and you are not going to really uh, help that child succeed. So in Ghana, for example, there's a new curriculum and teachers are being retrained to understand that children should be seen and heard in the classroom and that the classroom should become student-centered. It's not easy, but it's working. Uh, for the most part, many teachers have come to realize that it's much easier getting the children to participate than treating them as, as people who are not part of the instructional process. But it's still not going to be something that happens in a day. But it's, it's a work in progress, and I think we need to begin. But at least the curriculum should acknowledge the fact that there's a deficiency in society, and therefore we need to address that in the interest of all of us, it's not just for the child, but for our socioeconomic transformation, we need an assertive curriculum that ensures that children are developing their critical thinking skills. Thank, thank, thank you very much for that. And, and if you need to drop off, just let us know, because we understand, okay, sure. we understand about your political um, um, mm. uh, priorities. Um, and so, but, so thank you. Uh, if I take... The next question for uh, Mr. Adi Adetosoye, uh, and I'll ask two questions in one. Um, so the first one is explain how poor safeguarding can lead to poor education outcomes. And the second one is um, explain how, how can desig designated safeguarding leads be positioned in Nigerian school? Will there be, will there be consequences for infringement? Thank you, thank you, Charles. Uh, on the two questions, um, the particular point about the safeguarding leads is actually to enable um, and really to help um, to ensure um, a quick turnaround in terms of safeguarding policies in schools. Um, so I personally don't really see it as a challenge uh, in the sense that, um, as Mrs. Awadi said, uh, one or two schools, including some of the private schools, the Lagos actually now have um, safeguarding leads. Um, and I think the second point is a very essence um, in terms of if you don't have a good environment for a child, of course, to learn, then clearly the attainment uh, will be impacted, uh, which again is actually backed up by research in this country. Um, and it's definitely something that we need to work together uh, really to ensure that the Nigerian child has a good opportunity to learn. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Dr. Yao, are you still there? Yeah, you may have. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, yes. I just want to get one or two questions in before you leave, because people are so curious about and, and briefly, they want you to shed more light on the four C's and also explain the Bloom taxonomy and summarize the role of education in national transformation. There are three, three questions there that are kind of lumped together for you to give very quick answers to. Okay, uh, role of education in national transformation, you really have to begin to take a look at the role education play. And sometimes it's not, uh, it's more about the impact it didn't have on things like health. You see, more educated people in terms of even maternal mortality rate in our rural areas, it dwindles, it goes down when you have more educated uh, populace. And beyond that, uh, there's a uh, research that shows there's increased uh, productivity uh, with more education. Uh, you are able to uh, remove certain uh, stereotypical, stereotypical issues in society, ignorance and others are uh, diminished. But, but the critical thing is that when you have a more educated workforce, uh, you also increase productivity. And that increased productivity, if you structure the curriculum well, also brings about, you can also bring about innovation. And, and, and all these things are the result of a quality accessible and a relevant education system. 
So if you just do education without looking at how relevant it is to your, uh, to your needs, then you are not going to reap the benefit. But all the research out there have shown that recently there was a research by the Boston Consulting Group in the US uh, that showed that in developing countries, two most critical issues for development are education and governance. But they also concluded that education has impact on governance. Quality governance comes from quality education and therefore education becomes very paramount. And the research also has shown that between 1929 and 1957, uh, in the US, 40% uh, of their GDP growth was as a result of investment in education. And this, the Asian tigers, every one of them, the transformation has been possible because education was uh, focused on. And especially important metric is the gross tertiary enrollment ratio. If you're able to move with that, your economy develops. And of course, as we said, it's not just increasing the number, but also increasing the quality of the education itself. So given the time, let me uh, move on. The next question was, please. Um, yeah, it, I, think, I think you may have covered most of them. So, so, and I know you're looking at the time. So if you need to leave now, I understand you've given us a commitment. If there are questions, directly to you, 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 you will endeavor to provide written answers yeah, for the NSA. Yeah, we will provide for your website. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. So if thank you, need you to so leave. much. Thank All you. Right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Tola, do you have um, questions for our panel members, please? Okay. My next question now is to a young 15-year-old Shade, who spoke really brilliantly. So this is to Shade. And um, Shade, how did you cope with, uh, but, 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 you know, the constant of Shade, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you please okay, repeat so the question? How did you cope with the constant bombarding of emails from, from your teachers? I do remember that you said that if something got you into trouble, so how did you actually cope with it? Um, I would try and like, make sure I constantly checked it and that there wasn't anything that I didn't check and I would double, I'll check it in the morning, then like after each lesson and at break and then after school, just to make sure I didn't miss anything. So are you, in the, you know, you mentioned your sister that the, your sister coped better because, you know, they had the Zoom system. So are you saying that you feel that the system put in place for your sister was better than um, how the school addressed it? Could you explain, give that more? And um, yes, yes, I do think it was better because um, they were interacting with their teacher. So if they needed any help, then the teacher was right there and they could ask them. And it was more like organized because after the Zoom lesson was over, you knew you were done with that work and you could go into the next thing. You weren't really spilling into the time of the next lesson. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, um, Jared, I just want on the back of that question as a director. Um, of education in a local authority. Do you have any perspective on that question in terms of, in terms of Shadi's experience? Sorry, I'm having a technical difficulty there. Thank you, Charles, um, for the opportunity to comment. Uh, I mean, I think it's been um, a, a real challenge for schools um, to adapt, particularly new technologies in a really rapid um, time frame. Uh, you know, certainly there's an argument, and I think not without merits, that um, for too long, new technologies have not been adopted and not been adopted quickly enough within education. And if you like, this has been a catalyst for that to change quite a lot. And I think where schools have had the um, uh, access to technologies, that's perhaps eased some of the pressure um, uh, of you know, receiving emails and work by emails and provided greater opportunities for those interactions with students. I think we and we've sought to support schools with this, but where um, I think they've learned pretty quickly and adapted um, as best they can um, and continue to uh, look to improve their interactions as indeed we may move towards more of a, a, a national lockdown potentially um, within the UK. So I, I think that they've had to learn very quickly um, and I think uh, all schools have wanted to do the right thing for their students. They've, they've worked incredibly hard to do that. Um, but I think there's, there's lessons to be learned um, and we are absolutely keen that we learn those lessons and we support schools in, in improving the experience uh, such as that that um, Shadi has, uh, has shared with us. So, so thank you. 
Right. Um, can I ask um, my sister, um, Mrs. Tuni Awushi? There's a question here, which uh, I just wonder, as uh, someone who just retired recently as permanent secretary in the education department, on the back, someone said, on the back of what uh, Mr. Aditosuyi has said, said, does it mean the NSF and Nigerian schools should now move into the realm of activism around um, this whole issue about safeguarding? Do you, do you have a view on that, please? So Mr. Aditosuyi, of the no, to you, to Hello? you. I just wonder whether you covered that question. That question should be to him. Yeah, yeah. I know the question is to Mr. Adi to say, but I, I, I'm interested in getting the permanent secretary perspective. Is, assuming we're still, we're still um, an active permanent secretary, how would you get Nigerian schools to get more involved around the safeguarding issue and become more active? And would that create any conflict of interest? First and foremost. I think part of what I wanted to suggest to NSF is that going forward, they should uh, liaise more with the Ministry of Education in terms of policy and in terms of training of teachers with the Teaching Service Commission, because it will help to earn us. If I were not to be on this platform today, I wouldn't have known majority of what you had gone through to assist some schools in um, Lagos State, that is one. Two, um, having said that, I believe the state government is really proactive. Like I said, there is no teacher coming on board now that will not have read the law on child uh, safeguarding of a child. And so if you go against it, you'll be prosecuted. Really, really prosecuted. So if okay. uh, the NSF want to come in, they are free. To collaborate. Thank you, NSF. There you go. We've got we've got a conduit. We've got a link. Um, she might be retired, but she still has influence there. And um, let's knock on the door. And if it uh, doesn't open, let's break it down um, politely um, or metaphorically. Is absolutely important. Uh, before I call on Tola for the next question, um, 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 Indidi, um, there's a question on youth crime here. Someone says sometimes the problems experienced by children are more intrinsic than an extrinsic your view please indeed are you there sorry i i showed my video instead of unmuting <laughs> um <laughs> yeah it, it it is it's in, it's intrinsic that's correct but what they get internally comes from what they get on the outside. So we've spoken a lot here today about the importance of the environment. Can't stress enough how important the environment of, um, of education, the education system is for a child sure. to develop the kind of intrinsic, intrinsic uh, qualities that they would need to be able to cope with the struggle that society presents to, to them. And I think that, you know, as I mentioned in my presentation, that cohesiveness between what's happening in society and what's happening within the individual, it's broken there. There's, there's a disruption there because of the many, you know, barriers that they have. And so, you know, it comes back down to those people that are closest to the young people to work with them, such as the teachers or the frontline practitioners, the parents, et cetera. Right, thank you. Um, can I just... Um say to colleagues uh, two quick things. One is I understand some people have sent questions by email. It doesn't matter which platform you use to send the questions to us. Um, we won't be able to take all questions today, but um, I believe members of the panel have expressed their endeavor and commitment to respond to every question um, that has been asked today. They'll be posted on the NSF uh, uh, platform. Uh, again, it's, it's a hook to get you to continue to be part of this NSF big family. So please, please uh, bear with us if your question is not taken. Um, it's not out of love. It's just because of time pressure. And um, But we'll answer all those questions and post them because they are very interesting questions. Every question is important to whoever is asking that question and the rest of us. And second, like I said before, we've now come to two o'clock. And we knew this was going to be the case. I did play with you, and I hope you remain with us for the next five, ten minutes, please, so that we can go through these and just 
uh, summarize um, uh, the day. So Tola, any question please, as quickly. Okay, yeah. I've got two questions. One is definitely for the PAMSEC and the other one I, I think could be taken by any of our panelists. So the first question here says, how can parents understand that extracurricular activities um, are more important for a well-rounded education? And the second one says, um, how do um, reps try and bridge the gap between the less privileged and when they say reps here, they mean national reps. Okay, so how do you bridge the gap, gap between the less privileged children during lockdown? So one is definitely from the PAMSEC, um, how can parents understand that extracurricular activities are really important for a well-rounded education? And the second one is how do national reps, national leaders try and bridge the gap between the less privileged children during lockdown? The extracurricular activities, like I mentioned, actually uh, bring out or build in our children right from the infancy. If you remember for those of us that had gone to schools in the 80s, the 90s in Nigeria, the Boy Scout, the Girls Guide, the inter house sports, they are bound, they, 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 they are avenues to bond, they are avenues to teach us resilience, they are avenues to know that you can get out of the house and still be safe within the confines of an environment they're teaching you how to respond to um, issues around you, you no? Know? So we need to instill it in our children. We need to make them know that they need to participate. They need this entire sport. They need to run. Look at what is happening out there now. If they're just the ajebotas, like we call them, they will have fainted, you know? But the strong ones, they are determined. They are asking, we're not living here. So these are things that you just don't come in and uh, assume. It must start from the reading culture, sleeping well, eating well, irrespective of where you are, either you're poor or rich. These are things that builds up resilience in any child. Children should learn to laugh at themselves. They should learn to, to, to take corrections from their failures. We parents, we don't want them to fail. We well, were saying we should let them fail. In failure, there is there, there is another there is success in it because that is the least they can go, and they will rise up again. So please, parenting is very key. Um, government, you have your own part to play. Alumni association, in as much as you want to uh, develop infrastructure, adopt a child, adopt a child in your school, do that adoption. And, and see them through so that at the end of the day it is part of resilience they too they will grow to do the same so please thank i hope i've answered you find thank you very much and i like that particular challenge about adopting the child um, um we make a difference in the world not by what we say but by our action and that leads me to very quick questions because again because i'm conscious of time so the first question is um to bimbo on the back of these various challenges that have been thrown, is NFS, NSF, sorry, NSF, is it ready to take this challenge and run with it? And why, before you answer that question, Dr. Remy, if you just get prepared, uh, again, very short answer, people want to know more about the needs, uh, please. Yep, so start with Bimbo first. You need to unmute, unmute yourself. Yes, I think I'm in now. Um, yeah. I'll try and make it as quick and brief as possible because I know that time is far spent. So we've had a fabulous day here today. Um, quite frankly, I believe that um, we are maturing as uh, we've evolved and we're maturing as, as, as an organization. And we are now uh, sort of fully equipped to run with whatever uh, challenges that lie ahead. I mean, um, Lots of um, very, very encouraging suggestions have been raised today. And um, the whole NSF team, uh, both the leadership team and our planning committee team, we're all very, very fired up and committed to run with things. Um, 
and uh, we've we've get we've learned from mistakes in the past, and we've got more experience now. And the future is actually very very bright. And um, yeah, thank you. Think, um, the best is yet to come. Thank you. I, I, I told you guys, look at his handsome face and his soft voice with Belize <laughs> stillness in him. Remy, <laughs> Remy, over to you, please, very quickly in okay. as short as possible uh, about yeah, need. So Need. Okay, thank you. Um, Need is actually a school improvement project that um, NSF obviously set up and we were able to launch it last year and we've started with training. So it's basically a way of giving back to our school, giving back to our teachers in particular, and we have in conjunction with our education consultants designed a program wherein um, schools um, issues and their needs are taken into, into consideration. And so what we've done so far, because of the lockdown as well, to deliver training, which, as I said earlier, has helped our school principals and the, those that are head of various um, subjects to design their school improvement plan. And that's been useful for their going back um, to school, to learning and teaching. We also, the, so need is in different stages. It stands for NSF Edu Excellence in Education Development. And so every school that sign up to read um, via NSF will be consulted. We will have our consultant visit or speak to their principals and we'll use that to design their own uh, training. So as I said, it's in three different packages. We've done the initial one. We'll move on to the silver, to the bronze, and then to the silver. And the idea is that at the end of it all, the school, depending on how far they have come and how they have built their portfolio, will be um, hopefully attain a certain kite mark. So Thank you. need is there for all of us. Uh, all schools in UK, schools alumni can sign up to it via NSF. Thank you very much. Um, um, you know what I say, when people start leaving your party, uh, it's time to close it. I'm seeing some people dropping off from the screen. Um, I pleaded with you and thank you for your indulgence that uh, we can extend this beyond two o'clock. But so I just need to round up now. Charles, but can, I, uh, can I ask you a question, please? Which, because, uh, which I think people would like to know. Me. Uh, because we are educationists, we ask different kinds of questions. So could right. you ask the question, please? It is about your twin arrangement. Yes, I saw I saw that on the platform. People are asking so, about a twin about a twin yeah, arrangement. Fire on, please. So <laughs> which 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 we have with St. Olives. And people will know St. Olives is within a lot number of Bromley. It's one of the best grammar schools in the country. I just I just had the courage. I had the opportunity um, some years ago. I was inspired and I said, listen, what difference can I make to my former school? And one of the big differences I thought about was, how can I twin them with one of the best schools in, in, in the UK? And that's a challenge in terms of my perception because my school, I went to a Muslim school when I was a Christian. St. Olives, as the name connotes, is a, Christ, is a Catholic school. So, uh, sorry, it's a Christian school. I think it's um, an Anglican school, I'm not quite sure. But to try and twin a Muslim school where I was quite, um, a daunting task in terms of my perception, but the reality was quite different. We were very welcome, the principal of the school, the lead officer, and apparently it's finding the opportunity. They were actually looking for an opportunity to have a twinning arrangement with a school in Africa. And we became the very first school they were going to twin with in Africa. They had one in India, they had one in Europe, in Holland. So we became the very first school. With the support of my, uh, mayor at the time. One thing I do in Bromley Council, a massive thank you to my colleagues. Brad. I take advantage of them. I blackmail them, use them to benefit my former school. We set up the arrangement. It's working. It's not free of its own challenges. Uh, they meet virtually. They've done about five projects together. And ultimately, the dream one day is that they will exchange visits. They will go to Nigeria. They will come over here. A number of things. And currently, we're also looking at uh, a partnership with them and with Bromley libraries, the local authority libraries around e-library. E so my school can have access to their e-libraries. We've got the days of having a library with stock with hard copy books along gone by. So if students my, in my former school can have an arrangement to tune in, um, sorry, to be able to access the libraries, e-facilities -libra uh, e from Bromley libraries and, and St. Ola, wouldn't that be great? It would just be knowledge and learning on the go. 
Uh, we're looking into that. And um, yeah, so I'm quite happy to provide fuller answer. I'm quite happy to come to, I believe one or two school, Christ School at Duikiti, we're thinking of doing it as well. Um, I cannot remember his name now, he's gone my memory, he's a lawyer. He wanted to invite me to come and explain to them how we managed to do it. Bimbo has been to our association. If you want to come and visit our meeting, Bimbo will never regret it. He came twice. He was fed because we have real parties and he, he went to home. We fed and he had taken away with big fish. So we don't do meetings um, without feeding people. So I know there's COVID-19 currently, but one day we'll come out of that. So I know I've rushed that through but I hope he's inspired other people to do the same. And the same thing applies. If there's anything you guys are doing, we need to learn from. Yes, no one is an island. No one is a man Friday. We can share from that. On that note, if I just quickly try and, um, I don't want to abuse people too much and try and bring this to an end by a few thank you. It'd be remiss of me not to acknowledge the quality, the quality of the presentation today, the integrity, the sincerity, the robustness of the evidence put together by all the speakers from Dr. Yao to Adia Detosoye to Mrs. Awusheyi to a young uh, colleague, Shade, to Indidi to Jera. Thank you so much. I believe colleagues use the exit poll to give us feedback, but I believe I'll be extremely surprised if people fail to see the inter interdependencies and the connectivity between all those various speakers. Thank you for spending up your time, especially on a Saturday, because these are real quality people. Moving on, again, just thanking um, the colleagues of the NSF, absolutely important, because one thing is to have a dream. The other thing is you can sleep over your dream and start snoring and wake up in the morning and forget it. But to actually have a dream and make it happen under the leadership of Dr. Remy, and I said earlier, I pay tribute to Dr. Uh, Aro Busoye, who did in the park behind it to Dr. Remy, but the patience that she's developed, working with the likes of myself, I'm not easy to work with, working with the likes of Tola Ayeni, who is challenging and rightly so, and we need all those challenges to bring fruits to bear. Mr. Niyi Kuku, who's adopted chief, uh, to uh, one of the finest brothers I've ever met. He spoke very softly, but he's just behind the scene. Is Mr. Rashid, uh, again, thank you so much. And, and the big man himself, um, our big brother, Wale, sorry, I said Wale, uh, 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 what's his name? Um, Mr. Eleye. Okay. Uh, it's uh, okay, okay, Eleye is absolutely brilliant. He's an educationist, he's passionate. Anyone who knows him, education runs through his blood. He's worked successfully in local authority, including Wadham Forest. So thank you very much as a committee. Behind the scene, the unsung heroes are the technical people here. I can't read all the names of, but Rashid is part of them. And my big brother, Daniel, he loves his food, but he loves his technology. Thank you for the technical team. Again, because of time, I can um, read out every name uh, of that. So thank you, because it takes the technical part to make this work. And finally, to the NSF leadership. Again, I said every one of us is a leader, but Wale and Bimbo and uh, the rest of the leadership team, um, you are uh, an exemplar. You should be proud of yourself, what you've done, what you gave birth to some years ago and it's still going, the passion you put behind it, the dedication and the fitness to succeed happens. And I just leave you by saying, as leaders, you do two things. One is, one is to set a vision and get followers behind you. The second thing is to say thank you to your followers. And in between, to remain indebted to all those followers and the people you serve. Thank you so much, have a wonderful day. And I'm sorry we've taken it beyond the time, but I hope it was worth it. Thank you so much. <laughs> well done. <laughs> well done, all. Thank you. Well done. Well done Thank for you, good seminar. Thank, well Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Very informative. Perfect. Very, very interesting. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Congratulations. Thank you to the presenter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well done. Well done. Thank you to the presenter and the host. Well done. And the host. Your retired but not tired. <clears throat>